well, at this stage, we're, we're prepared to call South Brisbane and we're saying that Jackie Trad will be defeated. Um, on first preferences, the, the Greens are on 39.6. There's no way that the Greens are going to finish behind Jackie Trad. It, it might narrow, but even if it narrows, the LNP are on 22% and those preferences are flowing, will flow to the Greens. We haven't got a preference count, but that's what's going to happen. If you look at the um, two-party preferred swing that we're seeing, that's 8.7% swing. Um, the, the Greens will win that and that, that um, Jackie Trad will be defeated and Amy McMahon will be the new uh, Greens member, the second Greens member of the Queensland Parliament by winning South Brisbane. All right, Anthony, thank you. And the successful candidate, Amy McMahon, is standing by to have a chat to us. Amy McMahon, first of all, congratulations. How do you feel? supporters are feeling. We can't quite hear you at the moment. So you've defeated a deputy premier, a power broker, one of the most well-known people in state politics. What do you think was the difference? Oh, look, I think the difference is that we know that people are fed up with both Labor and the LNP. They're fed up with cash for access meetings, they're fed up with secret royalties deals, they're fed up with cuts to the wages of teachers and nurses. And instead, the Greens have been going out with this really positive vision for the future of Queensland, where we can use the state's enormous wealth to fully fund our essential services, to have 100% publicly owned clean energy, construction jobs, building 100,000 public homes, free public transport, free school lunches for all Queensland kids. We've gone out with this really positive vision for Queensland and everyday Queenslanders have responded, as you can see. Uh, we're so excited uh, about this opportunity to, to fight for everyday Queenslanders. So do you think that you'll be able to influence, it's just yourself and Michael Berkman, two MPs in Parliament, do you think you'll be able to pass any influence of those policies onto the major parties? Look, the, this, uh, this result tonight in South Brisbane, we've also seen big uh, swings in McConnell and Cooper. This sends a message to the political establishment that the time when mining corporations are able to dictate to our political system who gets what is completely over. And this time we're going to have Greens MPs in Parliament fighting for everyday Queenslanders, putting everyday Queenslanders first. That'll be a team of MPs He'll be fighting for things like 100% publicly owned clean energy. He'll be fighting for free public transport and housing. Uh, and that's what we'll be able to do with, you know, we've got Michael and uh, a few others hopefully tonight in Parliament. And this sends a message to, to all the Labor and the LNP representatives that it's time to put Queenslanders first. All right. Amy McMahon, McMahon thank you very much for your time. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Miles, Anthony Green's called it, Jackie Trad, one of the most powerful figures in Labor in recent times. She's lost her seat. What's your reaction to that? Oh, look, that's obviously a sad result for Jackie, um, but it's the result of the LNP's decision to elect more Greens to the Parliament, and they're going to have to answer for that, I think. Well, it, oh, sorry, it can't we, can't been... we can't keep having that, Stephen. It's exactly well, it's what Labor no, did in Maywar at the I last election. <laughs> um, a Green was elected in Maywar at the last election on Labor preference. Yeah, well, so you can't pretend you've this, got a moral position now you will need to in circumstances where it's exactly what you Amy did McMahon last takes. time. It's every exactly what you Every position Amy McMahon did. takes will be because you got her elected. That's outrageous. It's true. If, if you have a huge primary vote on your own, you don't need preferences. This is a tight seat. Jackie Trad didn't have enough of a personal following just on a primary vote, did she? Uh, it was a tight seat and of course we're disappointed to lose it. But it, it wouldn't have happened if the LNP had had any principles whatsoever in their allocation of preferences. Do you think Jackie Trad will be back or do you think she'll bow out of politics altogether? Uh, well, I'm not sure. I'm sure we'll hear from Jackie later in the night. Well, she well she's not letting us in. Yeah, she's not been keen to talk to us. <laughs> what is that about? Perhaps if Jackie's listening, she... <laughs> We've got Dan Conifer nearby, I believe. OK, well, I'm, uh, I'm not across those plans, but I'm sure uh, we will hear from Jackie in due course. Why didn't the Premier campaign with Jackie Trout at any stage during the campaign? Well, look, I'm not across those decisions. I certainly did. I door knocked in, uh, door knocked in South Brisbane. Um, uh, it's a, a seat that Labor had held for a very long time. Um, 
but uh, once the LNP made their decision to elect Amy McMahon, that's, that's, that was the inevitable result, really. It's very so, personal for Stephen. He's a very good friend with Jackie, and um, you know, that's why he's upset. But uh, in the end, the voters have, have, like the voters have <laughs> um, made their choice. And as you have rightly said, the primary vote is up for the Greens, not just there, but in a number of seats, at the expense of the Labor Party. Well, can you just explain to people why Jackie Trad had become this bogeyman for you, but also she became a, a target of the Greens as well? Well, as I said earlier, uh, Jackie is an extremely polarising figure. Um, she's very forthright in the views. Uh, and as Amanda said, um, many of those views are very, very similar to the Greens and uh, she prosecuted personally uh, many policies that uh, you know, Queensland has had issues with and now she's paying the price for that uh, in that seat. And it wasn't that long ago uh, where South Brisbane was an extremely safe Labor seat. And that's no longer the case. Well, it was the seat of the Premier, Anna Bly, at the time. But can I bring in David Spears now, David, because you want to make a point here. Yeah, look, I just wanted to raise, uh, just roll this little grenade into this conversation about Jackie <laughs> Trad. I had one Labor source suggest to me that she might uh, end up trying to get one of the winnable positions on the Senate ticket for Labor. I had another Labor source say, rubbish, that's ridiculous, won't happen. But Anthony Chisholm, as a Queensland Labor senator and a holder of one of those plum Senate uh, position, uh, positions on the Senate ticket for Labor, what do you think? Well, the plum number two spot wasn't very successful at the last <laughs> federal election, David, so it's not much of a prize. But uh, within the Labor Party, we go through a full pre-selection. Every branch member gets a vote. Uh, I'm willing to put my hand up again, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm not concerned about Jackie. I'm concerned for her as a person. I'm a good friend of hers. Uh, when I was State Secretary, Jackie was my assistant. Uh, we worked well together on a number of election campaigns, and uh, I actually think that she is a loss to the parliament. Um, she's a loss to the Labor Party, uh, and she achieved great things as the member for South Brisbane and as Deputy Premier uh, while she was there uh, and Treasurer. Stephen Miles, I'm interested in right. your... Yeah, have you, yeah, oh, yeah, have sorry, you David, keep going. I was, just gonna, I was just gonna ask the Senator if he'd heard that talk at all. Uh, no, look, I was handing out with Jackie at pre-poll yesterday and uh, we were only focused on her uh, being returned and obviously that was our hope. Uh, it's not going to turn out that way. Uh, I think the only disappointment from the interview with Amy McMahon is Matt didn't ask where the party was um, so that Tim and Amanda could go to it afterwards. <laughs> well, thank you, David, for rolling that hand grenade in. Feel free at any time during the night to pull a pin out on one and send it our way. Uh, Amanda, Will do. <laughs> Amanda Stoker, um, is, is that something that you think that, you know, Jackie Trad will want to pick up because she just seemed like a political animal? She was state secretary, served at a, a state Just level. Look, the rumour that um, sorry, Anthony, you're right. <laughs> the rumour that Spearsy's heard is one that um, has been fairly widely heard, and um, whether or not it, whether it's the Senate, whether it is a plum safe Labor state seat, um, you know, Labor's got form for taking people who miss out in uh, marginal seats that they value and plopping them somewhere else. They don't have the same connection to local community um, that is a big part of the LNP's culture. I mean, the benefit of that has been experienced by Stephen when he made a move um, from Maywa to, um, to Marumba. To where I grew up. Yeah, but, but you started out in Maywa, right? And the same thing was experienced too by Cameron Dick when he missed out in Greenslope some time ago. So there's no reason why she couldn't find a similar sort of opportunity. Um, but that's a matter for Labor. Um, what I think probably gets missed in all of this is the fact that South Brisbane is a seat that is unlike most of Queensland. Um, it is generally very left-leaning, it's got a bohemian kind of culture and um, it's attractive to many people for that reason and I think it actually means that voters in South Brisbane are a little bit different to what you might expect in other parts of the state. Okay, They've got well, their we own are, culture. We are seeing it in Maywa, we're seeing it in Cooper and a little bit in McConnell so it seems to be a central Brisbane trend that we're seeing. But we want to go further north again. We want to go up to Townsville uh, to talk with the Labor MP, Scott Stewart. But before we do that, we're going to go to Anthony Green just to get the latest on the count. Yeah, and the Townsville figures there, 29% count. I just thought I'd check the pre-poll number. There were 10,000 at the returning officer. So they're still to come. That's basically a third of the electorate. And there's 4,000 postals to come as well. 36.9, so Labor's ahead on first preferences. The LNP 31. 
Canada's Australia Party has dropped towards 11%. The Greens have got 10. So it's a real battle over preferences. And um, we're not getting many preference counts in any of these Townsville seats. So I'm not sure what's happening to all the preference counts. But the two-party preferred swing we're seeing there is no particular swing. Labor's ahead. So at this stage, there's no way we're calling Townsville. It still remains in doubt. Anthony, thank you. And Scott Stewart joins me now. Thank you for your time this evening. <laughs> Your supporters are making a little bit too noise, too much noise for you to be able to hear us there, Mr. Stewart. Yours, <laughs> yeah, yours they are. is very excited. Yours is the ALP's most marginal in the state. <laughs> you might want to turn around and tell them to be quiet so that we can do the <laughs> interview. <laughs> Do you want me to put my deputy speaker's voice on and tell them that's it, otherwise they'll be ejected? Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Um, it's still looking super close there tonight, Mr Stewart. Is that your reading of it too? Yes, that's exactly right. Look, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work done over the last three years. This is always the marginal seat in Queensland and, you know, we've worked hard over those three years, but uh, it's still too tight to call, I think, but we'll continue to be uh, optimistic. We have already talked a bit tonight about the crime problem in Townsville. Were people talking to you about that? Yeah, look, certainly we, we've known for, uh, for a while that uh, crime is a major issue for people. They, they talk to me on a regular basis. Uh, we've done a lot of work in that space and we'll continue to do a lot of that uh, work as well. Uh, we knew that the, uh, the curfew uh, solution that the LNP introduced was never going to work and I think that, uh, that was reflected back uh, on the polls. But uh, I think one of the things that we do see is that when you have low levels of unemployment, you have low levels of crime. And that's certainly the importance, I think, with the Palaszczuk government's uh, economic recovery plan is about creating those jobs, not only now for our, our workers, but certainly for the future for those kids who are sitting in our classrooms or our kids who are actually, you know, uh, maybe on that, uh, that crime treadmill at the moment. There is real opportunities for them because of the work that the Premier is doing about creating local jobs for local people. Mr Stewart, with COVID this year, it's easy to forget in a way that Townsville had a massive natural disaster in the last couple of years with major flooding. Uh, in terms of that, the, the economy of Townsville, what impact is that still having on the seat of Townsville? Yeah, certainly. Look, we've been doing it very tough for quite some, some time now, I think. When you think about uh, Queensland Nickel closing its gates and, you know, 800 people lost their jobs in one day and we had over 3,500 indirect jobs lost because of that closure. We saw the impact of the drought and uh, how, how that affected, uh, I suppose, Townsville and uh, the downturn in the minerals commodity market really impacted upon our mining sector there. And of course, then we had the floods. Uh, just this year, when we opened our brand new stadium, we had Elton John uh, ready to uh, open that stadium. And of course, the, uh, the Cowboys Broncos game. Uh, we were really on that launch pad ready to go and of course uh, COVID's had a bit of an impact again but I think that's the importance of that economic plan. It's, it's a really clear plan about creating those local jobs for our local people and particularly for our kids. Our kids need to stay in our regions uh, rather than heading down south towards you guys uh, but there's, there's real, uh, real jobs for them in the future as well. Gee, it's a big challenge ahead though, isn't it? Yes, certainly, certainly. It's, uh, look, it's, it's going to be a, a tough job ahead of us. Uh, I remain optimistic about, um, you know, particularly the count, uh, but I'm, I'm ready to continue to work hard for the people of Townsville. Scott Stewart, thank you so much for your time tonight. We'll let you get back to your noisy supporters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we do it big in North Queensland, that's for sure. Thank you. It is 18 minutes to nine and we have got one third of the vote counted for Queensland votes. Good evening, I'm Matt Wordsworth. Welcome to the election centre of the ABC at South Bank. Let's check in with Anthony Green, our Chief Elections Analyst for a state of play in Queensland. Yeah, well, let's have a look at those first preference sites. We're up to 31.7 now. The Labor 38.7, LNP 35. Greens 9.7, One Nation 8.4, Canada's Australia Party 2.9, uh, United Australia Party 0.6, 0.7, uh, 
maybe some of the most expensive 0.6% of the vote anybody's ever got. But um, the change in vote that's occurring, the Labor first preference vote is up 3.3, the LNP is up 1.3, and the Green and One Nation is down 5.4. And what we're seeing in terms of, we'll have a look at the chamber and, uh, no, uh, uh, let me see, I have to go to this button first. Operator error, the screen works. If you put an idiot in charge, things happen, you see. Um, chamber. 31.8% of the vote counted. If we look at the seats we're definitely giving away, um, we've got the Labor Party on 46. That's been bobbing backwards and forwards between 45 and 46. The LNP is now up to 31. Um, Chatsworth has just fallen towards them, such is an interesting figure. Um, I might go and have a look at McConnell again. McConnell is causing me great grief because basically, um, uh, I, I won't try and bring it up, but McConnell, there are three candidates all the way roughly the same vote. And the minute one pops in front of the other, you get a different preference estimate and the whole, whole result changes. We've got all this stuff which deals with close seats, but it doesn't really deal very well with close seats where the, it's on first preferences and the, and the preferences are not symmetrical and you get different results. So McConnell, I might just have to force to remain in doubt and just leave it there for the rest of the evening to just take it out of the totals. But that's the current position. And I'll just do one other thing, which is to look at the swings again. Those swings in, in South East Queensland 2.6% towards Labor, and the swing in regional Queensland is 0.8 towards the LNP. So there's a distinct difference there. Um, we're still waiting on preference counts in a number of seats, the Townsville seats, the, the Tharangawa, uh, Tharangawa and, Mar and uh, Mundingborough, which just haven't got preference counts. So there's a few things like that we're watching out for, but they're starting to come in some seats, and we're starting to get a few pre-polls and postals arrive. Um, and Chatsworth was interesting, because it counts up to 61% when, once we got the first of the, the pre-polls in. So there's some interesting things going on at the moment, and uh, um, we'll just keep everyone up to date. Anthony, thank you. Senator Chisholm McConnell, the Education Minister, Grace Grace's seat. W what are you hearing there? Um, we're still uh, hopeful. It's again that trend of the postals and pre-polls where Labor and the Liberals are doing well at the expense of the Greens, so a similar thing that was happening in Cooper. Um, so I haven't got any updated figures, but if that trend does continue, then that would be encouraging for us. That ALP number, 46, you'd have your eye on that? Yeah, it's... Uh, you know, I'm probably moving from hopeful to optimistic, uh, as I was at the start of the night, uh, but looking good and a number of seats in doubt and it would be good to hear uh, from Anthony uh, Green at some stage about what his nine in doubt are as well, because um, that might enable us to focus in on them a bit. OK, we might have to get to that one a little bit later on. I just want to talk to the LNP about how they think they're going statewide. Tim Mander, we just saw then uh, at 32 per cent of the vote counted, the LNP is running at about 35 per cent. Uh, someone who is less than optimistic about the LNP is your former leader, Campbell Newman. He's hit Twitter to say, spare me the COVID-19 excuse for what's happening tonight in Queensland. The LNP primary vote was 36 per cent a year ago. We had a problem prior to the pandemic. Hmm. Well, I'm not going to take any advice off Campbell Newman, that's for sure. Um, we, uh, the, the situation at the moment uh, is not looking good. Um, I'd much, be, much prefer to be in the Labor Party's position than our own position. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But look, this has been an extremely tough an election from opposition. Been very, very difficult to get oxygen over the last eight or nine months. But if Campbell Newman's analysis is correct, you were at 36% last year. Should, was that the problem? You had a problem then, before we even knew about COVID-19? Well, well I, I would argue that before COVID, that uh, momentum was changing and that COVID provided the cover for the Labor Party, that what the Labor Party needed. They've taken advantage of it uh, extremely well. They've spent around $6 million on Queensland advertising uh, under the guise of COVID, which has basically been government advertising. Um, they've outspent us three to one on television advertising. That makes it extremely difficult to get your message out. Well, TV advertising um, doesn't seem to guarantee success. We look at Clive Palmer. He's a one-man stimulus campaign for the broadcasting and publishing industry, it would seem. Um, Amanda Stoker, David Spears touched on an issue I think we need to talk about as well earlier on with his chat with Karen Andrews and this destabilisation campaign of Deb Frecklington uh, from within the LNP organisation earlier this year. Karen Andrews perhaps a little bit understating her response where she said Deb Frecklington has had a bit of a tough year. How would you rate that problem with head office in terms of this issue that Campbell Newman is raising about the LNP's primary vote? 
Look, I don't think that factored in the result at all. And the reason is that her team was immediately 100% behind her. And so anything that might have been there for a moment was gone um, almost as quickly because she had the 100% committed loyal support of her team. And so I think to look back to that now is something of a beat up. But at the time you said she shouldn't be blaming bullies, that she shouldn't be, blaming, blame, shouldn't be using the gender card. That, like that, that were well, your quotes. I have a principled view that anybody who's in... You didn't in... back her in. You said the no, team backed her and you didn't. There's no need to play grubby games. Um, I've got a principled <laughs> view that anybody who's in politics has to have um, a tough enough skin that they can have hard conversations about hard things with anybody. So they shouldn't stand um, up to and, bullets? Well, I don't think... I don't think she was being bullied and I don't think she had any difficulty dealing with them she because she is strong and she is smart and, as I said at the time, she is a great leader. She said she was standing Look, up to bullies. You can play your grubby games if you like. The fact of the matter is um, she did a great job, her team were right behind her, she was backed in by a great deputy and to the extent that anything like that might have read its head for a moment, it was squashed just as fast. Tim Mander, was she being bullied? That seemed to be the consensus among state MPs at the time who, who said as much. Well, what mattered was that Deb did stand up. Um, she proved that she had the medal. She proved that she had the backing of the parliamentary party. Um, I mean, we have not been more unified um, in my memory in the LNP. Oh, quite right. Um, Deb, <laughs> Deb, Deb has... Um, I think done a fantastic job. I really, I really do. She's had a very difficult situation with COVID. She has really found, she really found her mojo towards the uh, middle of the campaign. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that she couldn't have done anything more than what she's done. And um, you know, I think she can hold her head up very, very high. Still very early days with regards to seeing some of these other results that have to come in. Uh, you know, let's call it for what it is. It's, it's disappointing. Uh, but do you see those numbers and say, we can't win from here? It will be extremely difficult to, to win from here, but it's, it's still early. There are, you know, let's wait for all these uh, postal votes to come in and they'll be coming in for the next 10 days. And they could have a difference in some, in some seats. I think what um, Anthony says is true. It, it would be good to look at those doubtful seats. That'll give us a bit of a, a better idea of where we stand. Um, but it's, um, you know, there are a heck of a lot of votes to be to be counted yet. Well, Tim Mander, on the vote count, let's go back to Anthony Green to have a look at some seats around Brisbane, Anthony. Yeah, we're looking at Redlands. Uh, now, there were a couple of oddities at the last election that Labor normally wins Redlands, you know, Labor wins Redlands and Aspley and Mount Omni and Mansfield when they're doing really well. In the last election, Labor Party didn't do that well, but they did win um, Din win Rin Redlands. Kim Richards elected. Henry Pike is trying to win the seat for the LNP. And at this stage, if you look at the first preferences, we've got 20% count. Another means the election was a very slow count. But Labor's on 43%, Henry Pike's 34 And there's not many people there who are going to help the LNP with preferences. Uh, if we look at the change in vote that's occurring, both major parties up, the One Nation vote has collapsed. It, it is interesting that um, the fall in the One Nation is not just reflected. It hasn't gone to the LNP. Some of it seems to have gone back to Labor, which is uh, maybe that 35% of One Nation preference that normally flow to Labor. There is a small swing to the LNP. The Labor Party is ahead, uh, but Redlands can't be called at this stage. The next seat, next door, is Mansfield. Now, this was another late seat. The, the Labor was helped by the redistribution last time. Ian Walker was the LNP member defeated by Corinne Mac McMillan. Uh, she's well ahead there on first preferences with 11% for the Greens. And when we're looking at an estimated preferences, we're seeing a 3.4% swing to Labor. Now, if the swing is towards Labor, even if that comes back on later counting, then the Labor Party would hold that seat. So that's a good result for the Labor Party in Mansfield. And that's one of the seats the LNP probably would have... If they were doing well at this election, that's one of the seats she would fall. I'd like to say that, you know, if you go back through time, it, this was one of the seats that was held by the Nationals in the 1980s when the Nationals governed. So it's a, it's a sort of seat that tends to go with government. It's a real bellwether. Um, green slubs. Now, the reason I brought this up is because the Greens are narrowly, narrowly in third spot there. Uh, now, if they get ahead of the LNP, that becomes another seat where Labor could get run down on preferences. I suspect they probably wouldn't in that seat. But I think the other thing is we haven't got any postals and the like in. And as we've seen in other seats, the postals and the pre-polls 
do not seem to favour the, the Greens. The Green vote does drop off with those. They do better with, with absence, but I don't think that will narrow. And I do think that Joe Kelly will go on to hold that. And the same story in Miller next door, Mark Bailey. Uh, is on 41%, Liberals 28.5, Patsy O'Brien 23.3. The gaps here is larger, but again, um, this is the same pattern we've seen in Melbourne. The Greens win one seat, and then that vote starts to spread at the neighbouring electorates. And uh, in some of these seats like that, it's a, it's, you know, sometimes it's a, I think that's probably too hard for the, for the Greens to win, but that one's interesting to watch. But uh, yeah, that's a trend all across inner Brisbane. Um, and that's been an interesting, uh, interesting thing to see. And that's what sunk the Green, the Labor Party in South Brisbane. McConnell, the Greens are still in third spot, but the three parties are still very close together, so it's rather hard to pick. But uh, yeah, we're seeing that trend in all those inner city seats. All right, thank you, Anthony. Anthony Chisholm, uh, it seems like the Greens are going to suffer here from not being very well organised on their pre-poll and their postals, but we're seeing votes in the 20% in a lot of places we haven't seen before. Yeah, it's a bit of a trend we saw at the federal election in Queensland as well, where the green vote is moving uh, out of the inner city. I think a lot of it's got to do with house prices. Um, I'm well paid as a senator. I couldn't afford to live in the inner city. Um, so I think younger people are um, buying houses in the next ring, so that would make sense with uh, Mark Bailey's seat, Green Slopes, Stafford on my side of town. Um, so the green vote is spreading out. And that actually might, in a way, help us in a seat like McConnell, um, where it'll keep the green vote a bit lower uh, and enable Grace Grace to get across the line again. I'm intrigued, though, then, Stephen Miles, why you would say, I don't like the Greens when we seem to have an increasing number of Greens voters in South East Queensland, why would you seek to alienate them? Oh, because our objective is to elect Labor people to Parliament. The LNP are electing Greens to Parliament. But it does show the contempt he has for people who don't think the way he does. One of the things you want from a government is someone who is prepared to govern for all, whether or not you got their vote in the first place. Somebody who's prepared to reach out and say, OK, you mightn't have agreed with me on the 31st of October, but I'm still going to do the right thing by you for the next four years. And when you see so the contempt that... Un do I'm saying no, the, no, con I'm the saying contempt... I'm saying we won't do deals with the Greens. Are you saying you the will... The contempt that underlies that slur against the character of people who vote differently to you, I think speaks volumes about the way you'll approach government. And Queenslanders should be concerned about that. OK, Senator Stoker, we're going to head north of Brisbane where Labor is hoping to capitalise on the retirement of the sitting MP in Palmerstone, Simone Wilson. Anthony Green, take us through what's happening in Palmerstone. How's the count going? Uh, well, as I said, I'll just remind everyone that Simone Wilson won in the last election in the circumstances of a very complex election with a disendorsed Labor MP running as an independent. Uh, look at the first preference votes and you can see it's still only 13% count. Good grief, what's going on here? 49% uh, for the LNP. Uh, this is actually making me nervous because I haven't looked where it's from. This is an electorate with two ends. Uh, at Palmerstone, uh, the uh, Brabby Island end is very strong for the LNP. The Caboolture end is very strong for Labor, but the Caboolture end is where most of the population growth is. At the moment, it's 49% for Labor. If you look at the change in vote, the Labor vote is up 11%, and the One Nation vote has just collapsed since the last election. The LNP vote's the same. And uh, um, on those numbers, the Labor Party would be ahead on first preferences, and there's nothing to suggest that that's not going to be the result. 7.8% swing and a Labor gain. Uh, but I, I hadn't looked at the percentage counted before that number came up. That makes me slightly more cautious, but there's been nothing in anything we've seen in any polling place in that electorate which suggests other thing, anything else. The one thing I would say is there was a pre-poll centre in Bribey Island this time where there wasn't last time. There was 11,000 pre-poll votes taken in Pumice at Caboolture last time. This time there's been 11 pre pre-poll votes taken in um, Bribey Island. So when that comes in, that pre-poll centre, it's going to be a very different swing. But everything we've seen has been encouraging for the Labor Party in Palmerston. All right, Anthony, thank you. And Ali King, the Labor candidate, joins us now. Ali, thanks very much for sparing some time tonight. What's your assessment? We've only got 13 per cent. What are your people telling you? Look, I think it's feeling quite positive here, but there are many, many votes here to count. Um, if it is positive for us, then really it is, we hope, a victory for people here in Palmerstone because Anastasia Palaszczuk and Labor have some really wonderful announcements in the bag for 
healthcare infrastructure for roads, for school infrastructure, and we're really excited to be able to deliver those as part of a Palaszczuk Labor government. But there are many, many votes to count yet, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Yeah, so you were uh, contesting Maywa at the last uh, election, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. So what's the difference in the seat of Palmerston? What are the different issues that you saw at play when you've moved to there? Look, this is an electorate where people are really, really committed to their strong public services. And there's no doubt whatsoever that the Newman Frecklington cuts um, of, say, 731 nurses in our electorate here are something that people absolutely remember. And I have here in Pummerstone, there are nurses who, who have helped us on this campaign who remember what it was like when Deb Frecklington and Campbell Newman cut back nursing positions from our health area. And so that's been a really significant er um, issue for people here in Pummerstone. Yeah, so what, what's the one thing that you want to achieve in Parliament in this next four year term? So if I were elected as the member for Palmerstone, I'd be really excited as part of a Palaszczuk Labor government to see our commitment around two satellite community hospitals delivered. That will just mean more health care closer to home for people here in Palmerstone because one is located right here on Bribie Island. It will address health commuting into the future um, and that is just a once in a generation opportunity for people here on Bribie Island to get their very own public hospital and it's a wonderful, wonderful commitment for this community. All right, Ali King, thank you so much for your time. You're ahead. Perhaps you've won it. We might uh, have to update you on that result later in the evening. Thank you. The seat of Traeger in the state's northwest is the second largest electorate, taking in the mining city of Mount Isa and stretching to the Northern Territory border and Gulf Country and east to Charters Towers. It's held comfortably by the Catter's Australian Party leader, Robbie Catter. It's just gone nine o'clock here in Queensland and 34% of the vote has been counted. Let's go to Anthony Green to get the big picture. Yep, it's the same figure we've been seeing for a while. The Labor Party's bob bobbing around in the high 80s, 38s, sorry, high 38s. Uh, th around 39. The LNP is around 35. That's drifted up a little bit as the count's been going on. The Greens have dropped down a little bit, 9.6. Maybe that's the start of the pre-polls and the postals coming in. One nation still constant there on an 8.4. And let's look at that change in vote again. Again, that's the key feature. The Labor Party's up 3.4. The LNP's up 1.4. The Greens are now down slightly. Um, they may be good, doing very well in the inner city of, Sid of Brisbane but they don't seem to be doing as well elsewhere in the state. I'll have a look at where that number is coming from. And again, One Nation down 5.4. What I want to do this time is talk about um, some of the seats that are changing. We've got, what seats are changing? We've got Caloundra and Palmerstone we've marked down as ALB gains. Now, that's significant. They're both Sunshine Coast seats. And the Labor Party was swept out of the Sunshine Coast on the, in 2006 on the Traveston Dam issue and haven't come near to it again since. Um, neither of these seats have a sitting LNP member. <clears throat> and both of them were marginal. So it's interesting that, uh, as I said, we just looked at that Palmerstone figure. Maybe it's a little more confident in the prediction than it should be, but I still think from there, Labor can win that seat. So at the moment, we're giving Caloundra and Palmerstone to Labor, and we're saying the Greens have gained South Brisbane. But what's interesting is to look at the seats in doubt, um, because there's a whole bunch of seats in doubt. The Labor Party's ahead. It's a very early count. Um, the LNPs are heading with Sunday, but haven't won it. Uh, McConnell, Redlands, Tharangawa and Townsville, Labor's ahead. We haven't given them away. And we've got the Greens ahead in Cooper. So there's a, a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten seats there, which remains in doubt. And, and the one other thing I'll say, um, now I'm not going to call the election yet. I mean, everyone wants me to call it so they can let off the firecrackers and put the straps across the screen, but I'm not prepared to do it because I think it is important to be cautious. Don't be bullied, um, Anthony. You know, 
if, I mean, if, if we were in the United States, we'd be letting balloons down and firecrackers and, you know, elephants and donkeys around. <laughs> no, no, not in Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> Um, look, the Labour Party's got 44. What I will say is the LNP's on 32. At the moment, it's struggling to get back to what it held in the last parliament. Now, if it does well, it will get back to 39.40. Um, at the moment, I can't see how they get into government on the figures we're seeing. Um, if you've got two or three Greens, I mean, Labour may lose another seat to the Greens. Um, you've got to get a couple of Catters Australian Party can candidates there. You've got an independent in Noosa. You've got one One Nation candidate. If the LNP ended up with 41 seats, they could cobble together the cross bench maybe to get to 46 if Labor said they absolutely would not do a deal with the Greens, and I don't believe they would say that. Um, but um, I can't see the LNP getting into government on those numbers unless there's something else to come in the numbers to come. But Labor, I also can't quite see Labor getting to 47 yet. So that's why I'll just leave it there and saying Labor's prospects of getting back into government are better than the LNP's of getting into government. That's what the figures look like. But as I said, it's what, 9 o'clock with 35% counted. That's basically all the polling places and we're just waiting for another 30 to 40% of the vote to come in in the next two hours. All right, Anthony, thank you. The next two hours are going to be pivotal. Uh, Anthony Chisholm. You were saying before, you wanted to see the seats in doubt in Anthony's doubt column. We've got them now. What do you think when you see them? Yeah, it, it's interesting because there's some seats on there that I wasn't anticipating. So Harvey Bay, for instance, which uh, had that retiring LNP member, um, we're still getting information on that uh, elderly population. So there will be a massive postal and pre-poll there. Uh, but I do know that uh, Adrian Tantari, our candidate there, did a fantastic job um, with limited resources, but second time candidate, he re really battled away. Um, Clayfield, for instance, which uh, I spent time with Philip Anthony, our candidate there on Thursday night uh, and the previous week, uh, I gave, I put $300 on the bar for his election night party. I'm starting to wonder whether it's not going to be enough money, um, but <laughs> it probably is a bit early there. But I, I saw Philip Anthony out on a pre-poll booth and he was saying the bookies had him at, like, very long odds. Yeah, right. Well, he's again a second time candidate. He's run for the council ward there and he's just a hard worker, a really genuine person. So it's great to see him doing well. Um, so it's just seats that we didn't really anticipate. So it is going to take a time to bit of, get a bit of a handle on them. Um, but as Anthony said, prefer to be us, uh, but uh, still looking to get to that 47 number. Stephen Miles, Ali King, who Matt was just did the interview with in Palmerstone, um, you know her well, I think. She's a former advisor to you. Mm. Um, she mentioned the Newman government cuts. Campbell Newman was voted out in 2015. Labor has now traded for two terms, uh, reviving his name. You couldn't do that for a third term, could you? You'd have to start running on your own record, wouldn't you? Uh, well, Campbell keeps popping his head up and helping out there, but it, it goes to what people think of as the LNP brand. And when you go out and you talk to Queenslanders about the LNP brand, they think about cuts. They think about cuts to health. They think about all of those austerity policies that you saw in the, in the Newman government. And so uh, they characterise that as Newman-esque, but, you know, the costings that Tim, Tim uh, handed down this is, again, also this had is those a full kind of cuts, five years ago. We've had two terms of the Palaszczuk government. If we have a, a third again, and it'll be four more years on, would you really go back and milk it one more well, time? Well, it depends whether, it depends whether the <laughs> LNP go to another election promising to cut the public service, because that's, that's what they did again this time, and that's why it was a potent... That's right. totally ridiculous. It is. It's just, just 2 Wrong, cut. it's ridiculous. You well, that's, that was cut. after... You Cameron, said Dick, Cameron Dick is going to you save you three borrow. billion dollars you you over borrow. six months, said you one borrow. billion dollars from the health department, you you and borrow. said it may be through uh, staff wages that they'll choose. No, that was happen. over and above. They're going to take a billion uh, dollars from the health funding department. Increase. So that was just over turn it off, Stephen. Increase. The election's off. You announced it's a cut. tiring, mate. You announced it's a cut. boring. Gentlemen, it's tiring. Gentlemen, we've got David. We've got David Spears standing by for his analysis. David, help us I was, here. I was enjoying that. Uh, <laughs> look, it, while we await for um, 
a little more confidence around the big picture, uh, you know, before um, any calls. Uh, uh, just a couple of points to make. On the minor parties, there's a couple of things to say here. Look, the Greens have had a good night. Uh, they have, at the least, doubled their numbers in Parliament from one to two, right? So they'll, they'll be celebrating that. It, it, look, if Labor manages to scrape a majority here, they won't need the Greens to get legislation through. But this will create more nervousness for not just state, but federal Labor MPs in inner city seats that are under threat from the Greens. One Nation's had a shocker. Uh, no, no other way of putting it. They've had an absolutely appalling night. It is puzzling why Pauline Hanson wasn't more visible in the campaign. Clive Palmer too, for whatever amount he spent. This is a terrible result. Perhaps that tells us populists aren't necessarily popular during a pandemic, particularly if they're playing down the threat of a virus that is uh, 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 viewed certainly by older voters as a big threat to them. Uh, the Catter Party, though, has established that foothold in the North. And I want to go to the North because we've got the, uh, the National Senator, Susan MacDonald, joining us from Townsville. Thanks for your time this evening. Look, there'd, there'd been some hope, I think, on the LNP side that you'd, you'd do better around Townsville and further north, but particularly around Townsville on the crime issue. Yet we see in Mundingbara, Tharangawa at the moment, slight swings to Labor and in Townsville pretty much holding its position. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that what we're seeing is that elections held during pandemics are always really difficult. It favours the, uh, the incumbent. We've seen it in the ACT, in the Northern Territory, in New Zealand. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the US this week. But I think that's been a big factor, is that in a pandemic, uh, the fortunes favour the incumbent. Why do you think that is? Why are voters backing in the incumbent during, uh, during a pandemic? Is it because they're happy with how Anastasia Palaszczuk has handled this crisis? I think what we've seen is wall-to-wall -wall coverage uh, of the health issues every day for about eight months. Uh, and that has been very cleverly managed by Labor. Uh, they've employed a large number of pollsters and, and uh, media people to ensure that the Premier, the Health Minister and the Cho make commentary around corona and the pandemic every single day. So it was very difficult for us to get traction. I think we very appropriately uh, had a campaign where we were trying to shift the election from the last eight months of the health crisis back to jobs and the economy and crime, which are the issues that are facing Queensland. They're issues that Labor has failed on for the last five years. Uh, crime, particularly in the North, uh, but jobs, business confidence and the debt levels in Queensland... But the Labor vote, really just back to the point I was making, sorry to interrupt, Senator, but the Labor vote... The Labor vote isn't falling, uh, despite those concerns you know, that you campaigned on or the, the state counterparts campaigned on. Labor's vote's tracking reasonably well around Townsville. Uh, I think what you'll find is that we were making good inroads, but it was very difficult to get a share of the media's attention uh, until fairly recently. And I think if we had had another couple of weeks, we would have seen uh, better improvements in our polling and in the uh, and in the vote, but you know we've all got a part to play in this. But I do think that we were we found it very difficult to get cut through, to be able to win media attention, and to be able to put through a, a different message uh, to the health message, which I think Labor has managed very well, and they've kept kept the attention on the last eight months, not on the last five years. Meanwhile, though, uh, the Catter Party's done pretty well in holding its ground in the north of the state. Why has it been able to achieve that in this pandemic without the media attention and the issues you're pointing to there? Well, I think that uh, as an independent, which is what the minor parties are, uh, it allows them fairly free reign uh, to make commentary, uh, the advertising that they played. Uh, they're not uh, held to the same account that the major parties are. And in North Queensland, we like having a bit of that, um, that cowboy approach. And, uh, and so that's continued to work for the, for the Catter Party. And, uh, and so they've been able to hold their three seats. Uh, but really delighted to see that Dale Last has held on in Burdekin and seen a swing to him. Uh, and no doubt we'll start seeing other results as they come through. But it's still fairly early days. There's a lot of pre-poll to be voted, uh, to be accounted. And we've only got about 50% of the postal votes back. Australia Post's performance in this regard has been truly appalling. And a lot of people have been very worried about whether they'd get a vote at all or they'd be disenfranchised through that process.
Sorry, let me just, uh, I've got to wrap it up, but I, you've just had a go at Australia Post there. What's your accusation against them? Well, I think that if you apply for a postal vote and it doesn't arrive until either the Thursday of the election, before the election, or uh, for many cases people still haven't received their postal votes, then I think that's pretty poor for an uh, organisation that, that just delivers stuff. So perhaps if they were delivering uh, packages, they might have done better. But certainly people have been dis disenfranchised around uh, regional Queensland. All right. We'll seek a response from Australia Post on that. But uh, National Senator Susan McDonald, thanks for joining us. Terrific. Thank you. All right. Matt and Jess, back to you. Thank you, David. We'll let you get on to Christine Holgate with that one. <laughs> <laughs> She's got a few issues on her plate. Just a few. All right. Well, we've been talking a lot about the One Nation vote this evening, looking at it declining, it would appear. But they've also been a force in Queensland politics in the past. In 1998, they won 11 seats. So let's run through some of the seats where they've done well in the past with Anthony Green. Well, well they've done well in the past and they did well last time and they've failed dreadfully this time. In Ipswich, now, admittedly, last time the One Nation candidate was Malcolm Roberts, the senator who'd been um, disqualified from being the Senate and then ran in Ipswich at the state election in 2017. Now, as you can see here, Labor's vote is up above 50 and One Nation are in third. If you look at the change in votes occurring, the One Nation vote is down 13% on last time. Uh, if you look at Ipswich West next door, another seat where One Nation finished second, they're in third again this time, and that change in vote, once again, there's One Nation vote vote down 13% in that electorate. Uh, if we go on to Jordan, which is the new seat, the new Ipswich-based seat at the last election, Charis Mullins a member. Neil Symes, now Neil Symes, I think was 23 years old when he ran Lytton for the LNP in 2012, one of the safest Labor seats in, in Queensland, and uh, he of course couldn't hold it in 2015. Later joined One Nation, ran in Mansfield at the last election. This time he's running in Jordan, and he's the man who's been signing everything to say authorisation, done all the authorisations for One Nation. So he's heavily involved in the organisation. He's finished fourth in a field of four in Jordan, um, and the, the, there was a big vote for an independent last time, which is what that strange looking graph is. And the last seat along here is Logan, which is actually in Logan, not in Ipswich, but it's the next seat along. Linus Power, 53%, Clinton Patterson, second for the Green, and One Nation again going into third place, fourth, third place there, 15% drop in their vote. So clearly, um, I think some of the One Nation voters held up in some areas, and they've got done better in the seats which they didn't contest time last time and they're contesting this time. But in all these seats where they finished second last time, they've fallen to third and lost 15% of their vote. Anthony, thank you. Senator Stoker, what, what do you make of that? Is that just uh, the lesser influence of minor parties? Again, we keep talking about it, but during a pandemic? I or is the there something else going on? No, I think on? the pandemic has played an important role. Um, people tend to run to the bigger parties when there are times of uncertainty. Um, it's why it does tend to favour an incumbent, because the known is an easier thing to go with. Um, but I also um, am very hopeful that it reflects a greater trend of people um, expecting more from those in minor parties. It's very easy for those, including in the Greens, but also in um, some of the other minor parties, to, to promise the world because they never have to deliver. And um, the sooner people come to understand that um, in, in chasing the, the big promises of a party that never has to deliver, they can actually disenfranchise themselves. This discussion about incumbency during a pandemic, it benefited the LNP Lord Mayor at a Brisbane City Council level in March. He made an appeal, stick with what you know, and he was re-elected in Brisbane City Council and in other jurisdictions around Australia, Northern Territory uh, and the ACT. So, Anthony Chisholm, if that's the case, that doesn't bode well for federal Labor when the federal election comes along. Yeah, a couple of things I'd say to that. Uh, one is I think that uh, Deb Frecklington as opposition leader got a bit desperate this year, I think because she knew the election was so imminent, she wasn't so well defined. And I think back to that weird social media video during the pandemic when she was touching all the grocery items, just thinking she's desperate, she's trying to do things to get attention, and it backfired on her. When I compare the performance of Anthony Albanese as opposition leader this year, where he's been measured, um, he's criticised where the government have deserved it, but he's been constructive uh, where possible. So I think he's struck a better balance as opposition leader, and he hasn't, his ratings have 
has been uh, quite strong in published polling throughout the year. So he hasn't done himself any damage in a tough year. So I think we are differently positioned. Uh, the other thing that I'd say about the actual election campaigns and that uh, the LNP at the state level tried to rerun the last federal election campaign. Uh, they tried to make it uh, a focus on Labor, uh, relentless negative campaigning, uh, rely on One Nation and Palmer to do damage and try and sneak into government that way. Uh, and the people of Queensland have called that out. Um, so that's encouraging for me is that they've tried to rerun that federal election campaign from last time, uh, use that sort of sneaky strategy to just um, get in the back door, uh, but it hasn't worked. So I think there's a couple of you know, differences um, that would give me a bit of encouragement out of tonight. OK, let's look at some of the impact of the minor party, the KAP, uh, in the seat of Cook, because that seems to be uh, being a big factor tonight for Cynthia Louie, the ALP candidate for Cook. She's standing by to have a chat with us shortly. But first, let's get Anthony Green's update on the numbers there. Yeah, well, that's, this is the battle um, we expected beforehand that the Tanika Parker from the Canada's Australia Party would finish second. When we look at the first preferences at the moment, Cynthia Louie is on 48.6% of the vote, well ahead on first preferences. Ed Nipper-Brown is second, and he's 5% ahead of Tanika Parker. So I don't think even um, Brett Beaver-Neal's preferences for One Nation will get her into third place. She won't get, won't get... I don't think that gap can be closed on preferences, any of those. Now, we're projecting that by the end of the count, Cynthia Louie will be on 44%, but nobody else will be above 20. So that gap can't be closed. So um, I think we can say clearly that Cynthia Louie will be re-elected as the member for Cook. Thank you, Anthony. And Cynthia joins me now. Thank you for your time tonight. And I'm sure what you just heard from Anthony Green there will give you a great, deli a great deal of comfort. Oh, most certainly. Um, look, it, it was it was a hard slog for everyone, and I know I've worked really hard um, in the Cook electorate. And you know, just to hear that, um, and to see how much my communities have come behind me to support me uh, throughout this whole process is just humbling, and at the same time overwhelming. But very grateful. This will be your second term, Cynthia Louie. You were voted in for the first time at the last election. And this term is going to be a four-year fixed term, so four years ahead. What's your priority going to be? That's right. Four years. Um, look, I think the first uh, term was about really getting to know my communities and getting a really good understanding for community issues. Um, the next four years will be about, you know, making sure that we have the right services in communities to support uh, all the communities throughout the Cook electorate. I've always been upfront about this. We Cook is not your unique electorate in that we are vast and we are unique. And so, you know, we are always going to be faced by the challenges of remoteness. Um, in this case. So the next four years will be about supporting service delivery. It will be about creating more opportunities for local jobs. It will be about supporting um, all of the communities throughout the core electorate so that we are bigger and stronger for the future to, the future ahead of us. Um, there's a lot of potential for growth here and you know that's something that I'm really determined to work closely with all of my communities around to make sure that you know they are well prepared um, for what the future entails but most importantly we're walking this path together. In your assessment, what saw voters come back to Labor again at this election? Oh, look, for me, I think it was about people wanted to be listed, they, they wanted to be heard. My communities wanted to be heard. And that's something that I worked really hard over the last, um, over the last few years to make sure that, you know, my communities um, got, um, it, it were heard. And, um, and most importantly, they know that, you know, we are a government that supports communities right throughout uh, Queensland, no matter where you live. And like I said, most of my communities are regional and remote, and we face the challenges of, of where we actually are um, placed in Queensland. So I think, you know, building that positive relationships and, and partnerships with all of my communities was really important um, to get us across the line because, you know, the next term, I look forward to bigger and greater things to come because we've already established our partnership. It's about getting the job done. Cynthia Louie, Labor has three Indigenous MPs in the Queensland Parliament. Can I ask for your observations about the number of Indigenous MPs and in terms of how many Indigenous people you would like to see running for office in this state? 
Look, can I just say, um, having my uh, colleagues, uh, First Nations colleagues in Leanne Inok and Lance McCallum, um, and having them as First Nations voices in Parliament is, um, is humbling. Um, I think we come from a very different perspective. I can speak for myself personally, having been born and raised in the Torres Strait and was you know, raised on a remote community. So all of my education, um, I didn't leave home until I was 28. And, you know, and I've worked um, a number of years back in my community because I wanted to uh, make a difference in health outcomes in, for my communities. And, you know, and I think that perspective is really important when you walk in this political space because you know, it's all about perspective and it's, it's about our experiences, our personal experiences and what we bring to the table. And this is what I bring to the table. This is what my colleagues in, in Leanne Inok and Lance McCallum bring to the table. And I hope to see more Indigenous representation in Parliament. Cynthia Louis, thank you for joining us on the ABC tonight. All right, let's bring Anthony Green back in because I think, Anthony, you've got a point to make here. Uh, it's, it's a rather thing. It's a, we, we talked about the digital divide and things like that. Well, Queensland at the moment in these results has an alphabetic divide. A colleague at another network contacted me and said, have you got preferences for any electorate after Mulgrave? And I've checked and we haven't. We've got preferences for every electorate up to Mulgrave, but any electorate that starts with the letter N or later has no preferences. Uh, now, this is not, I'm sure this is not deliberate. I'm trying to find out exactly what's going on. But it's why we haven't been back to the Townsville seats. We've got no preference counts. Now I know why we haven't got any preference counts. It's everything after the letter N. So uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on. So is that something at the ECQ end, Anthony? It, it's, we are on the end of a feed from the Electoral Commission. There are no preferences for any electorate after Mulgrave, and we're not sure why. Okay. I, I suspect it's a technical thing. I, I, I don't think they're just banning anybody with a letter, a, start, a name that's starting after N. I think it sounds like a technical thing. Well, yeah, that would seem unfair, Anthony. So, but thank you. We'll hopefully get that sorted out very soon. Uh, Amanda Stoker, can I just go back to Susan McDonald? Sure. Uh, in her chat with David Spears... <laughs> what else do you say after? ...an organisation that just delivers stuff <laughs> that she feels very strongly about Australia Post. Is this like a... The federal government is just really upset with Australia Post right now. Look, I think what Susie's referring to is something that goes back a lot further than anything of recent weeks. Um, there has been persistent concern in some of our most remote communities about getting a prompt mail service, and this does crop up most elections. So I'm not surprised to hear Susie say it because she really is a voice for some of our most remote communities. OK, so there's not... Uh... A, a designated campaign here looking for a way of being angry at Australia Post? No, I don't think so. Um, can, I, can I provide um, some more information on Townsville in the absence of us having good pre-poll numbers to work from? Um, I provided before some data about how pre-poll votes were flowing um, in Clayfield. Now, granted, that's very different to Townsville, but I'd actually expect pre-poll votes in Townsville to go better than pre-poll votes in the southeast corner would. Um, now, at the last election, there were around 7,500 pre-poll votes. This time, you've got 15,000 to count. At the moment, we have a difference of 600 votes between um, the, the Labor and the LNP candidate. And if we were to apply the same rate of um, allocation of that 15,000 to the, the two major parties, you would get an LNP win in Townsville. So I'm going to, in the absence of ECQ data, um, be optimistic about our prospects in that Is state. it safe, though, to apply, to, ex to extrapolate what happened last time to this time? Because it does feel like a different election. And the people um, who might postal vote might, might not be the same as 2017. Well, the number of votes is taken from the last election. But yes. the rate at which I'm allocating them to the two parties is actually how it's being done in Clayfield in this election, which I think is a more conservative assumption um, than you'd probably apply if you were going to adopt an assumption for the conditions of Townsville and its hot issues at the moment. Anthony, do you agree with that assessment? Uh, I just got a text from Scott. Uh, when I left, uh, Scott Stewart, the member for Townsville, uh, when I left here at the last election, I thought he was going to lose. Uh, and he managed to get across the line. He's feeling a bit more optimistic tonight than what he was during the last election. So, um, you know, we're, we're, the Townsville story is pretty remarkable to think that uh, Mundingborough, where we replaced a candidate and have got a swing to us at the moment, uh, Thurrongau, which is always a tough seat with 
sort of three four cornered contests and Aaron Harper's retained that. Um, so on the whole, um, we're pretty positive about Townsville, uh, concerned about the actual seat of Townsville itself, um, but fingers crossed. Can I just quickly mention Maryborough? Just This is amazing what has gone on here. Um, our primary vote at the moment is above 50% in Maryborough. In 2012, uh, when we lost government, our primary vote in Maryborough was 11%. So it's gone from 11% in 2012 to 25% in 2015 to 45% in 2017 and is now above 50%. So that's happened in regional Queensland, Maribor, about a three hours drive. Um, that gives me a lot of hope that um, the Labor government can deliver for regional areas, but it gives me hope also the work we need to do federally um, that we can actually make inroads into these places as well. Senator Chisholm, Anthony Green is going to take us north of Brisbane now to have a look at some of the Sunshine Coast seats. Anthony. Yeah, just just um, let me go and get my seats. The this is Calandra. Now we're pretty confident that Labor's won Calandra. We've got preference counts, um, and 42.6% on first preferences, 7% 6% ahead of the LNP, with 11% for the Greens. The change in vote. There's been a collapse in the One Nation of 15.8%. It's the key feature of this election. It's a bit hard to see the other trends, but the collapse of One Nation and a rise of Labor Party vote in some areas. So there's uh, some interesting trends that have gone on. This is translating into a two-party preferred swing of 5.5%. Now, there's more pre-polls and postals to come, but that has factored in a very strong anti-Labor trend in the postals and pre-polls last time. So it would have to be an enormous trend this time to turn around that. So we're saying that Labor has gained Caloundra and that the new member will be Jason Hunt, who's uh, running in the seat for the third time. The next seat is Noosa, and of course this was quite a boil over last time with Sandy Bolton winning. She's got 44.9%. James Blevin, um, who has an interesting story, um, his family uh, was, raised, he was born on a farm in Zimbabwe, and one of the farmers that were sort of driven off their land and ended up being raised on the, on the Sunshine Coast. So he's, uh, he's running there for the LNP, but really this was always going to be a seat that Sandy Bolton would win, and uh, she'll go on to uh, it's a, a swing to her. And we'll look at the, the page for a victory. So Sandy Bolton has been Sandy Bolton re-elected in Noosa. And at the moment, it looks like she will be one of the people that Anastasia Palaszczuk and Deb Frecklington will be wanting to talk to in the next week. That's of course they will talk to them after the election because they just said they wouldn't do it beforehand. But let's not go there. Brent Mickelberg in, in Butterroom, he was first elected uh, at the last election, replacing Steve Dixon, who was the former LNP member, defected to One Nation in 2017, was the, LN was the One Nation leader of that election. Anyway, he's run as an independent and got twice as many votes as the One Nation candidate. Ken McKenzie, the eight Labour candidate, only on 28, 10% with the Greens. We'll just look at the two party preferred. There's a 9% swing coming out of those numbers because um, there is a big shift on the first preferences. But we still reckon Brent Mickelberg. Well, Brent Mickelberg, yes, we think the, he will retain the seat. I suspect that will strengthen once we get postals and absence. Postals and pre polls. Ninderi next door, Dan Purdy was first elected at the last election. Uh, Melinda Dodds is the Labour candidate, 12% with the Greens. If you look at the, uh, we'll look at the two-party preferred swing. There's been a 5.2% swing to Labor. So it swings to Labor in all the Sunshine Coast seats. Now, this raises the interesting thing. It's further away from the border than the Gold Coast. Um, it relies a lot on overseas uh, interstate tourists, particularly from Victoria, who can't come at the moment. But Labor's got a swing all across the Sunshine Coast. Has business not been as heard as much there? Have been locals been going to the Sunshine Coast instead? So that's something to consider. But anyway, Dan Purdy has been re-elected for, for the LNP in Nindere, but all the swings are towards Labor on the Sunshine Coast. Jared Blee, um, the former Attorney General, has got 46% of the vote. Two-party preferred swing there, another 3.6% swing. So this is the most consistent set of swings to Labor anywhere in the state, and they're all on the Sunshine Coast. So that's been... Uh, we'll just draw the hero page there. Jared Blay, he's been re-elected there. Uh, LNP retained. So um, that's the quick rundown of the Sunshine Coast while we're uh, waiting for some more postals and maybe some preferences from electorates past the letter N. <laughs> all right, Anthony, thank you. Right, we're going to go straight to Rockhampton, where James Ashby from One Nation is standing by to have a chat to us. James Ashby, thank you so much for your time tonight. Hi. Can you tell me, <laughs> can you tell me what went wrong for One Nation? Well, I actually think that we've had a, a net zero gain. There's uh, obviously the primary focus for us at this election was certainly to have Stephen Andrew re-elected in that seat of Morani. He's a bloke that uh, certainly won it uh, with 
obviously a, a good reputation of One Nation in that, that uh, area. He's only he's, he's retained that seat because of the work that he's done and obviously One Nation have um, put a lot of effort into um, putting uh, campaign material into that electorate. I think we've done well for Stephen to, to keep the seat of Morani. Yeah, no doubt you must be very happy with Stephen Andrew staying in Parliament. Uh, you're wearing Wade Rothery's shirt there. People were expecting that he was going to do quite well in with a chance there in Keppel. How do you explain this drop in primary vote for One Nation across the state? Well, it's only early at this moment and look, the seats of Keppel and Rockhampton um, I'm not saying that uh, we, we're going to win those, but there is still a, a hefty amount of that vote to go. Uh, we know that 960,000 people postal voted, of which we're finding out today through the Electoral Commission or late this afternoon, that there could be as many as 30% of those rejected because they didn't have the, uh, the second signatory on them, the witness signature. So I don't know what's going to happen in these seats. Of course, Labor played a good game. The fear game always works. And of course, uh, what we've seen uh, in tonight, I'm, I'm shocked by some of the results that Labor's got. It appears on the surface that we've, we've taken a bit of a haircut in some of our, um, in our votes. But uh, I just think that people, that the fear got the better of people. And when Labor you say fear, that, what are you talking about? Played that about? card right up to, to the very end. COVID fear. And, and I think too that the Liberal National Party certainly didn't put forward a very good alternative government in this state. I think also something that needs to also be uh, identified here, we have lost in every single regional market across this state, media. And I can't tell you how many local media have just evaporated from these markets. Rockhampton, Gladstone, Mackay, they've all lost their newspapers. So people, the only news they've had is from Brisbane and that has just been one massive fear campaign. What we need to see yeah. is newspapers back in these regions. I can tell you right now, without the newspapers, these local markets have had nothing to go by apart from Brisbane news. And do you think Pauline Hanson could have done more, could have campaigned more uh, and, and turned this result around? Well, I think Pauline campaigned uh, very heavily, at least for three months. I've been on the ground with her, and I can tell you right now, we've done more than 15,000 kilometres just in the, in the car alone, let alone the amount of flights that we've had to go and do in, in certain areas as well. Again, it comes down to the fact that you and the media don't have the resources. Now, the ABC whinges all the time that it doesn't have enough funding to go and do uh, uh, crosses from regional parts of this state. You've got all the money down there in South East Corner. Well, it's the same for all the commercial networks. They haven't got the resources. So I think that's part of the problem. One Nation has always traditionally done very well in the regions. You've had no cameramen. There's no snappers for newspapers out there. There's bugger all journalists. You're lucky they don't even have offices anymore. You've got journalists working from their, their dingy little corner cupboard in their house. That's what we're dealing with in regional Queensland. And you guys down there, you suck it all up. The ABC is pretty fat down there in Brisbane, but you We've do nothing the in the regional region. network. We've got we a few little had, Mr. Ashby, Pizzly, but you are no, right that got a lot of the newspapers Pizzly have little, little mounts of radio stations that you give bugger all to. Then you just network it out of some studio in Brisbane. That's what you're doing. No, we've got the same. We've got the same team that we had last election, Mr. Ashby. But you are right. There are a lot of newspapers that have yeah, suffered. Yeah, well, the bush is missing out. That's exactly what's going on. The bush is missing out. And I tell you what, under this Palaszczuk government, they're going to miss out even worse and it'll be the farmers that will suffer and it'll be you down in the southeast corner that will suffer most because your fruit and vegetable prices will go through the roof. We will be stung significantly. The fisher, fishermen out there will absolutely be raped and pillaged and I tell you what, it'll be Labor's fault. You All watch, right. it's coming. And you've okay. got four years to suffer this. OK, James Ashby, thank you so much for your time. with Queensland Votes. Thank you for your company this evening. Coming to you live from the ABC's Election Centre in Brisbane, I'm Jessica Van Vonderen. And I'm Matt Wordsworth. It is 9.36 Queensland time and 43% of the vote has been counted. Let's go back to Anthony Green. Yes, and uh, look at that first preference vote again. Labor's votes drifted up. Um, 
I'll just do the change in I'll go into the chamber in a moment because um, what just happened is we got all those preferences for every electorate after the letter N. So I think we asked the right question. <laughs> and um, that's the current position in terms of vote, the One Nation vote down there. Let's look at the chamber because the numbers just suddenly changed. We haven't had a chance to go and have a good look at them. Um, and certainly I need to go and have a look at the numbers for, for Townsville. But um, what we're saying now is the Labor Party has suddenly gone back up to 46. So it's gone from 44 to 46. There's a couple of seats that suddenly firmed up for them. We'll have a look at them in a moment. But uh, yeah, there's been some significant figures just come in. What I want to do is I need to go and have got one seat run. They were just talking about Rockhampton there. We should talk about it. Uh, Barry O'Rourke, of course, um, there was an independent finish second who was passed by One Nation and One Nation ended up finishing second last time. Uh, and, but this time, that's not what happened. The One Nation vote has fallen, the LNP vote is done. This is a traditional Labor seat. I mean, they even, they even held on to it in 2012. So that shows you how, norm, how normally safe it is for Labor. And the Labor vote has recovered with Barry O'Rourke um, having been the member now for a term. But again, the votes have gone a little bit all over the place, but still, Barry O'Rourke has been um, re-elected as the member for Rockhampton and uh, One Nation finished third. All right, thank you, Anthony. Well, let's go to David Spears down in Melbourne. He's our Insiders host who's on hand to give us some analysis during the night. David, what are you seeing? Yeah, well, just looking at uh, Anthony, they're updating on what is a bit of a choppy count tonight because of this huge number of pre-polls and postals and because of the, the technical issue that he's called out and got an answer on uh, from the Electoral Commission as well. But if anything, over the last half hour or hour, uh, Labor's statewide position has only improved in terms of its um, share of the vote. I want to bring in, uh, well, Federal Labor's most senior Queenslander, the Shadow Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, who's joining us now. Thanks for your time this evening. And look, Anthony's being uh, uh, you know, rightly cautious about things. You can chance your arm, though, perhaps. Do you think Labor has <laughs> won this election? I think you're right to describe it as a bit of a choppy count, David. Uh, there is a lot of unpredictability. We haven't really quite seen uh, an election like this before. But having said all of that, uh, things are looking really good for Labor. Uh, that is a tribute to Anastasia Palaszczuk and Stephen Miles and Cameron Dick and the Labor team. Uh, it is uh, certainly heading in the right direction in a fairly substantial way. But for all of the reasons that you've identified and Anthony's identified, uh, I think we'd want to see a little bit more before we conclude it for sure. No, fair enough. Uh, and I guess, you know, you'll want to wait for the, the Premier herself to make an announcement one way or another. Look, there's already debate, though, about how much of a factor the power of incumbency is, particularly during a pandemic. Uh, you know, we've heard some on the LNP side say all the attentions on Anastasia Palaszczuk are impossible for us to get much airtime and so on. Do you agree there's a point there? I mean, how, how big a factor is this incumbency during a crisis? Look, I think it's a factor, David. There's no use pretending that it isn't, but it's what you actually do with that incumbency that matters. Uh, and what Anastasia Palaszczuk has done uh, is to make a series of really difficult decisions, not just to safeguard people's health, which is the most important thing, but also to safeguard the economy. I think people have realised uh, all throughout Queensland, despite what the media commentary might have been at the time, uh, is that the best way to protect the Queensland state economy is to protect the health of Queenslanders. And she said that she would rather lose an election than lose lives unnecessarily. She meant it when she said it. And I think people have come in behind her in a, quite an extraordinary way. Uh, I was on four polling booths today, David, in different parts of the southeast corner. Uh, and I don't think I've seen a leader for some time uh, receive the kind of respect and regard that Anastasia Palaszczuk was getting from the people I spoke to today. The puzzling thing for, I suppose, many uh, watching um, uh, elections recently, Labor does do pretty well at the state level in Queensland, uh, you know, last time around, tonight. But at the federal level, I mean, you, you did have a very poor result last year in Queensland, as you well know. Why is that? Well, it's a source of some frustration, obviously, David. I'm not going to pretend that it isn't. But what it teaches us is that there are Labor voters, uh, not just in the southeast corner, but indeed uh, right throughout Queensland. And the onus is on us. The job is for us at the federal level, uh, the whole team, but especially the Queensland representatives, to make sure that Queensland's voice is heard loud and clear, uh, that's so that we can reach those people who are prepared to vote uh, for Labor uh, and make sure that we make the case uh, for a federal Labor government looking after all of their interests. 
Jim Chalmers, we will have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us tonight. All right, David, thank, thank you, you David. for that. Matt and Jess. Thank yes, you. thank you, David. We're just going to go back to Anthony Green because we've got some breaking news. Anthony. Yes, well, at the moment, I think we're, we're prepared to say that we can't see the LNP forming government this election. I'll, do the, I'll fill in the chamber, uh, and it just explains the position of, of why I'm prepared to say that, and then I'll go a little bit more into detail. We are saying at the moment, the Labor Party's... Well, we've got them to 47. They've just ticked over to 47. I'm not sure which seat that is. But the LNP's stuck on 34. They're just not going up, even if... Even if some of those postals and pre-polls and stuff come in much better for the, for the LNP, there's nothing indicating the LNP can get, you know, at the moment the best they can do is get back to the position they were before the election, which is 39 seats. There's nothing in any of the figures which indicates that, you know, that the what's to come is suddenly going to overturn everything, and they're just too far behind Labor. The only way they can get into government is getting several crossbenchers on, and they'd have to win several of their own seats first to actually get closer in terms of numbers. And the Labor Party's on 47. I'll just see if there's any more seats that we've got leaning one way or the other, and that gets Labor up to 49, and the LNP is still stuck on 34. There are Labor's, there are seats Labor is, is ahead in at the moment. The only caveat on saying that Labor's won the election is that there are still two or three seats that the Greens are really threatening Labor in. McConnell and Cooper in particular. They've won two seats and McConnell and Cooper are still a bit difficult to, to call. McConnell looks better for Labor. Cooper will want to see the pre-polls counted uh, and the postal votes and see if that changes the balance of who's in the lead. But at the moment, uh, the LNP can't form government. The Labor Party will be in office after the election. We are just not sure whether it will be a majority government or a minority government, and if it's a minority government, how many crossbench members I'll need to negotiate with. But at the moment, there's absolutely nothing to indicate anything other than the Labor government returned, and you can't see a way that the LNP gets into office from these numbers. Anthony, thank you. Tim Mander, I'll go to you first. Do you agree with that assessment? Uh, it's hard to argue, Jess, with that. It's uh, disappointing. I, I, I will say that um, some of the seats in doubt, there's been a relatively small number of votes that have been counted, 15 to 20 per cent, but it will be very difficult for us, there's no doubt about that, and uh, uh, that's incredibly disappointing. If you can't even get back to where you were at the start of this election, what does that mean? Well, I believe it means that the pandemic has had a, uh, a major impact on another opposition, as it has in other jurisdictions um, around this country and, and overseas. Uh, it's been, as I said earlier, very, very difficult to get oxygen uh, and there's a distinct advantage to be in control, to be in, in authority uh, during uh, a crisis and um, the government has milked that extremely well. Steve. And Stephen Miles, Deputy Premier, Deputy Premier for another four years it would appear, you must be very happy. Uh, yeah, are, are you calling it? Is it... Well, it, Anthony Green's projecting a Labor win. Uh, well, that, that would obviously be a great outcome. I just want to take up what uh, what Tim was saying. I, I don't think you can say that this is just a result of incumbency in the pandemic. I think it's also an assessment of how we handled the pandemic and how the opposition responded to that. You know, they they fumbled it uh, throughout. They they criticised our health advice. They criticised the health of, health officer. They called for the borders to be open when Queenslanders wanted the, the borders closed. And so, I don't think it's fair to say that it's just because they couldn't get any oxygen. What they did with that oxygen was wrong too. You, you just seem a little bit subdued. Do you not quite believe it's happening? Uh, no, it's a great... It, well, it looks at this stage to be a... 47, a, a really that's the number. That's the key number for a majority, isn't it? It is. And if you look at the only two seats that a Labor appear to have possibly... Well, the, the only seat Labor has definitely lost, the LNP have delivered to the Greens. The other seat we may lose, the LNP may have delivered it to the Greens. Uh, the LNP have not gained any seats of FASA or of anyone else. Anthony Chisholm? Look, it's quite remarkable when you think about uh, the LNP. When they lost government in 2015, they had a primary vote of 41%. So they're down 5% on that after two terms in opposition. Uh, and what do they have to show for it tonight? Uh, all they have done is helped elect another Greens to Parliament. So that is what they have to show for six years in opposition. Uh, and they come on here tonight and they do not, they try and say it's COVID or they blame Australia Post of all things. <laughs> but they actually need to accept 
uh, that they aren't representing Queenslanders at the state level. They need to have a good hard look at themselves. They had a, a huge brawl over who their leader was. Clearly there was dysfunction on the LNP campaign between Deb Frecklington's office and the campaign headquarters. Like you can't do that sort of stuff a couple of months out from an election. You need to be seamless. You need to be on the same page. They weren't uh, and they've fallen apart at the seams. Senator and Stoker, what does this say about Deb Frecklington's leadership? Look, I think Deb Frecklington has done an outstanding job, a difficult job, but she's done very well in difficult circumstances. Um, obviously, we'll all have that good hard look that one has after every election, win or lose. Um, but I think we can only say positive things about the amount of dedication and commitment and energy and positivity that she's put into this campaign, as has Tim. Will everyone within the party agree with that, though, in, you know, tomorrow morning in the face of bitter disappointment? Well, part of the job for all of us as elected representatives and indeed those who have organisational roles is to listen to all the different people in the party, get their views and do the good hard looking. But um, there's a real difference, I think, in, in tone and the robustness of the points of view that has come from uh, my colleagues on the other side of the table having reached that magic number. Um, in many ways, you could see it as um, a weaker result when compared to the way that this has played out in other jurisdictions who have faced what you could call the COVID effect. It's another way of looking at the same thing. Um, either way, though, it doesn't help the LNP and um, we'll need to do the good hard work that's necessary to make sure this isn't repeated. Yes, yeah, so this, this, the problem here for you is, that, is Brisbane. Hmm. What happened in Brisbane? Why aren't you appealing to people in Brisbane? Your leader's from Nanango, not in Brisbane, but Tim Nichols was a, a Brisbaneite last time around and, and, and you didn't win. What do you have to do to win these seats like your Redlands, the, the, the Palmer Stones, the, these sorts of seats that have fallen by the wayside? Um, look, I think you can approach that question from a range of different points of view. You can talk about um, the way that we go about campaigning, you can talk about message, you can talk about um, you can talk about it a whole bunch of different ways, but I think it would be to speculate to do that right now. It would be better, I think, to wait until we've got all the data in and um, we have a good listen to the people on the ground and what they're saying is the problem. OK, well, the time is approaching 10 minutes to 10 and Tim Mander, we're going to have to bid you farewell at this point. For those at home, this is not a walk-off from Tim Mander. This was pre-arranged. He's not storming out of the studio the, at this result. I'll get you to say a, a last couple of words before we welcome in David Janetsky. Sure. Well, look, it's no doubt it's a very disappointing result for us. Uh, we did. We were very hopeful about a number of those seats that it looks like we're not going to win. Um, I'm confident those many of those seats that uh, are in the uh, uncertain area that we w will hold once the um, the postal votes come through and the pre-polls come through and uh, I, I think that will secure those seats that look a little bit doubtful but of course we have to win extra seats and that was the issue. So it's incredibly disappointing. Um, we have to go away now and uh, lick our wounds and uh, answer those questions that you've just asked Matt. You know, what do we have to do to change things in Brisbane? The South East Corner is a, a great challenge. Uh, I can't let you go without asking if Deb Frecklington has to go as leader after this. I, I have absolute zero criticism of Deb. I think she's done uh, a great job under the circumstances and we've mentioned some of those challenges tonight. Uh, she's been full of energy, she's got better as the campaign went on um, and you know there'll be a lot of learning coming out of this. But the last think... thing I'm thinking about is, is those type of issues about um, what's the future uh, for Deb and others, uh, and, for, and for myself. So, um, you know, there's plenty of time for that naval gazing later on. In the meantime, we've got to find out exactly what the results are, and, um, and after that, we can, you know look at those type of questions. Well, Tim Mander, thank you for spending time with the ABC tonight. Election nights are one of those evenings where people often prefer to be surrounded by their family and friends, so we appreciate you being with us and offering your insights here this evening. My pleasure. Let's go back to David Spears. David, what are you thinking? 
Yes, well, I'm, I'm going to wrap things up myself uh, soon, having to get up pretty early uh, tomorrow morning. So just some final thoughts on where uh, things have landed. Look, I think, as mentioned earlier, for the minor parties, there's, you know, this is a terrible result for One Nation, for Clive Palmer, who had a crack here as well. A, a good night for the Greens, though, and building on a good performance for them in the ACT. Uh, but for the major parties here, I think the immediate uh, implication of a Labor retaining government is that this will entrench the view that the border closures at the state level have been popular, uh, that will embolden Anastasia Palaszczuk when it comes to decisions around the borders, and probably Mark McGowan in Western Australia as well, that the, the voters where it counts have, have endorsed the position. Look, it'll matter a great deal whether Labor ends up scraping in a majority or having to govern in minority, there'll be trepidation in Labor about you know, what uh, the consequences will be, the deals that'll have to be done and so on to get through a hung parliament. We know the experience of that at various state and federal levels. So uh, there's that to come. But for the LNP, uh, well, you know, you're already hearing the blame game that this is all because of the pandemic. This, you know, there's no other way we could have uh, won. That's not what they were saying, uh, you know, just weeks ago heading into this. Um, we know Scott Morrison... Uh, did spend some time there in Queensland. I don't think this result damages him too much. He retains a fair bit of popularity. We see that in all the polls. But, uh, look, this is a boost for Labor holding on there. The challenges we were discussing with Jim Chalmers for federal Labor is to turn these sort of state results into federal results in the Sunshine State. All right, David, thank you so much. We look forward to watching Insiders at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning and hearing from Terry Butler as well. That'll be a fascinating chat. Thank you and have a safe trip home. Thanks, guys. OK, let's go back to Anthony Green and have a look at some of the Greens' seats. Yeah, as I mentioned a, a, a moment ago, um, a couple of those inner-city seats were changing. Uh, now, first one's Cooper. Now, earlier, the Green was in first spot. Uh, we got a whole bunch of pre-polls and some postals in, and they dropped a third. Same trend we've seen elsewhere. So, to get to win from here, and, and neither of these candidates would be helpful for, for the Greens, um, the, the Greens have got to get back ahead, against, ahead of the LNP. And I think that might be a bit difficult. There's still a lot more counting to come. The absent votes, the Greens tend to do better uh, on the absent votes, but there's still some postals and some absence to come. Um, absent votes from other, sorry, uh, uh, pre-poll votes that were cast in other districts are still to come. So at the moment, the trend on first preference is towards them staying in that order. And if they stay in that order, then John T. Bush will win. So at the moment, we are leaving that one in doubt because this, this, this ordering issue, if the Greens finish one vote ahead, of the LNP during the distribution of preferences, then Katinka Winston Allen will win that seat. If they're one vote behind the LNP, then John T. Bush will win the seat. It's a battle, battle at the moment over the order on first, second, and third. And the same issue has arisen in McConnell. Again, early on, Kirsten Lovejoy was in first position, and she's dropped, um, and she has dropped back to third with the count. And if she stays in that position, and she's 2.6% behind the, the, the LNP in this seat, then, then Grace Grace will be. Like, we've got a 61.8% count at this stage. So I don't see that those orderings are going to save. So at the moment, I would say Labor's well positioned to win McConnell and in a position to, to win Cooper. But in neither seat is that certain because we're just not certain of this order of the candidates. It's a, it's a funny system, preferential voting sometimes. Sometimes the bronze medalist determines who gets gold and silver. Anthony Green, thank you. Well, we're going to welcome a new panellist who's joining us now, David Janetsky, subbing in for Tim Mander. Thank you so much for coming in this evening. You've obviously joined us at a time uh, of great disappointment for the LNP. Yeah, it's been a difficult night and uh, my heart goes out to a whole range of our wonderful candidates that have, that have given everything to the cause for the last, um, in some cases, 12 months since they've been pre-selected. So it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult for us to see a way through to victory right now, uh, but I, I'm really keen to see a lot of the postals and the pre-polls. I know it's been said all night, uh, but it's really important to get those postals and pre-polls in, uh, because I know even in my own electorate, my primary vote today on the booths was 42%, and my primary vote on postals was 61%. So in some seats, there will be a massive differential between primaries at booths and um, primaries in postal votes. So I, I want to see all those postals and pre-polls come in. 
So is it too premature for me then to ask you whether you would like to see Deb Frecklington stay on as opposition leader? Look, and I think it's already been said, but um, now's not the time for that. I, I think we need to get all the votes in uh, and, and hear um, exactly what's going on at pre-polls because we know this hasn't been an election day, it's been an election period. So for two weeks people have been walking in to vote and, and there's been massive numbers of people coming in. Um, I think uh, Deb has proven during the campaign she, she's irrepressible um, and extraordinarily energetic and um, you know, let's wait, see, wait and see till we get all, everything through and then we can have those discussions. And uh, I just want to you know, talk about our, our viewers who might be out in Toowoomba, uh, southwestern Queensland. I spent a bit of time there myself. Yep. Uh, they didn't get a lot of love this election. Anastasia Palaszczuk, Deb Frecklington, they didn't go west of the divide. Oh, well, we got things covered up there in the, in the Darling Downs. I, um, Do you think that the whole region's getting a little bit ignored? Look, I think uh, what uh, we've seen there. I was surprised that the Premier didn't come to Toowoomba North. Uh, there was a lot of resources uh, thrown behind the Labor candidate there, but our, but our, um, my colleague across James Street in Toowoomba has had a really uh, strong performance tonight. I was surprised that the Premier didn't come uh, to Toowoomba North, uh, but Deb, you know, she's constantly in touch with us and, and listening to the needs of the region and has been a regular uh, a visitor and also comes from just north just, to the yeah, south. Yeah, we just keep talking so about she's, Townsville, yeah, marginal seats where you want to be. It yeah. just seems unfair. I mean, a lot of the voters will probably think, why don't I get the love? Why, don't, why can't I be no, a no, marginal let's, seat? Let's just say good local effective members of Parliament. But I, uh, uh, Deb lives uh, nearby, so she was always passing through Toowoomba as well. So uh, uh, we did get plenty of visits throughout the last term. Senator Stoker, I just wonder about some of the interventions by federal MPs, not just MPs but ministers, uh, during the campaign and regarding COVID. We had Peter Dutton, we had Josh Frydenberg, we had Scott Morrison himself, um, certainly criticising a lot of the decisions that Anastasia Palaszczuk was making along the way. Uh, Queenslanders love a good fight, don't they? Do you think that might have worked in the Premier's favour? Well, I think the point that my colleagues were trying to make was that, by her own admission, she wasn't making the key decisions. She'd abdicated that responsibility to the Chief Health Officer and um, had made it very clear that she wasn't acting and taking responsibility in the way that Queenslanders, um, at least on our judgment, would expect her to. Um, I'm of the view, though, that the fact that she hasn't been properly balancing health recommendations and advice against the economic and other considerations, the social considerations, the other health considerations, including mental health, for instance, um, is masked in large part by the quality of the Morrison government's response to the COVID crisis. And so there may be down the track something of a buyer's remorse as um, a lot of those measures can't last forever. And uh, Senator Amanda Stoker, we might just leave it there because we are hearing that Deb Frecklington is close to speaking to the assembled LNP members at the Emporium, which is where the LNP, LNP function is tonight. Obviously not going to be the speech that she would want to deliver. We are assuming that Deb Frecklington will approach the podium to concede defeat to Anastasia Palaszczuk. We'll bring you that speech as soon as it comes to hand, as soon as that she gets to her feet, we'll cross back to the Emporium. But in the meantime, let's go to Anthony Green to talk about some of the seats in Far North Queensland. Yeah, and I'll just say quickly, we've got 47 as the number of seats there. We're confident about 47. It could yet be 50. Uh, that's, that's what the recent preference counts have determined for us in seats like Townsville where um, Scott Steele was ahead, we didn't have a preference count, we now do and we know there's been a 3% swing to Labor and Scott Stewart has been re-elected. 29% or oh, there's a lot of pre-polls to come but I don't think the pre-polls will turn around a 3% swing. So that's, uh, that's, that's what's happening there. Next door in Mundingborough, we've got 52% counted here. Les Walker's ahead on first preferences. And if you look at the, um, who's winning, we're saying Les Walker is the new member. He replaces Coralie O'Rourke. There's a small swing to him, and Labor has held Mundingborough. Tharangawa, the third of the Townsville seats. Aaron Harper, it's a much lower count, but we now have preference counts on these numbers. And we're also projecting there that Labor will win with a 4% swing. Uh, a 4% swing, that's just not turning around. When you talk about the two-party preferred being better on the than for Labor on the day than the postals in absence, 
in the way we do this analysis, it's not the vote we look at, it's the swing. There has to be a difference in the swing to turn that around. And I don't think there'll be a difference in the swing, which is built into our factoring here. <coughs> so Aaron Harper, we believe, has been re-elected in, in Tharangawa. We looked at the Cairns seats earlier. They have firmed up for Labor, 41% counted. Craig Crawford is well ahead with Aaron MacDonald, the Green, on 14%. And we're saying that... Um, <laughs> Craig Crawford has been re-elected with a 2% swing to him after preferences. And next door in Cairns, Michael Healy, 32% counted, 45.9, well ahead on first preferences. And we're predicting at this stage there's a 1.2% swing to him and Michael Healy has been re-elected. So we had some doubt over calling it earlier just simply because there was a couple of seats there with letters starting in the letter N and afterwards in Townsville and Tharangal, we had no preference counts in. They've arrived, we've just gone bang, 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 you can call the seats. And at this stage, Labor has a definite 47 seats, which means they're in majority. And then the question is, do they pick up any others? And they could yet pick up 50 seats as a total. Thank you, Anthony. Stephen Miles, those were the seats where Labor was supposed to be most vulnerable. Are you surprised by that? Well, they had great results in Townsville. Credit to our candidates and the Premier who campaigned really hard up there. Uh, we started the night saying that the LNP had to win what, three of those five seats, if you, if you look at the three in Townsville, Barron River and, and Keppel. Looks like we've not just held them, but um, you know, substantial swings to us in the, in the three Townsville seats so, um, and in Barron River. So that, that, they're great results. Yeah. Senator Chisholm, was 50 seats ever in your calculations? Uh, no, but I'm a bit of a pessimist when it comes to the elections and Labor Party. But I, I will say this, is that the absolutely cynical and outrageous effort of the LNP to announce a curfew in Cairns and Townsville came up for naught. Mm. And they should absolutely hang their heads in shame. It was a disgraceful policy. They first announced one when I was up there in 2004. Uh, it is absolute rot. Uh, and it's good the people of Townsville and Cairns have seen through it. They saw it for what it was and they've rejected it. Uh, and the LNP should announce tonight, and Deb Frecklington should do it in her speech, she should admit she got that wrong. Because it's not a way to treat the people of Townsville and Cairns. Uh, it is completely disrespectful. Uh, and it is something that I'm so happy tonight uh, was rejected by the people of Townsville and Cairns. Well, while we wait for Deb Frecklington to... Deb Frecklington to arrive at that function. David Janetsky, how would you respond to that? Was that the wrong policy? Well, I think every policy will now be up for debate um, on tonight's result, and obviously that will be part of it. I think um, that, that policy was always about trying to meet um, the expectations of the community, and, and the communities in Cairns and Townsville in particular have been living with this crime epidemic during the campaign. I've made, I made two trips to Townsville, two trips to Cairns myself. Uh, and to see on the ground there the concern amongst the community, com particularly the elderly, uh, you know, there was something that needed to be done. Uh, whether that or that's the right policy or not, we'll debate that again after this result. But particularly for me, the important part of that policy was all about the health response. So um, if children were on the street, then obviously why aren't they at home? So it was getting you know, them safely into a refuge or to get the health care and perhaps child safety intervention, that's, that's whatever was they, necessary. That's not how they sold it locally. So that, that's that not was, how you sold it locally. That was, that Don't was try the key and say part that of the policy. Whistle. It was it a was dog a whistle, whistle, pure and simple, and it backfired, and you should admit it. Just be blunt with people. It was, the, it was a key it was part a of that whistle. aspect part of the policy to try and get these kids. That's a very that strong accusation that it was a racist dog whistle. Yeah, it, it's and I'd expect you... nothing less, but it's the the key part of it was uh, the health response to get these kids the help they need. Oh, we're just seeing some shots of Tim Mander. He's obviously left here, the ABC at South Bank. It's only a short trip down Gray Street, it's just the other end of Gray Street from here to the Emporium. Obviously getting a, an ovation for his analysis on the ABC's election podcast. <laughs> election podcast. No, for his uh, deputy leadership of the LNP, uh, obviously a subdued mood in the Emporium. It's uh, not a great result for the LNP. David Janetsky, a lot of your colleagues there uh, are going to be very glum. Yeah, obviously it's it's a disappointing mm -hmm. evening, but like I just keep coming back to the postals and pre-polls. They're still, in, in a, particularly in a number of those Townsville seats, uh, where we have seen so much of uh, the competitive tension. We've seen lots of visits from the Premier and from Deb uh, to Townsville and Cairns. There's large numbers of pro postals and pre-polls yet to be counted. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'll be watching them really closely. And Amanda Stoker, mm. the seats that Tim Mander said that they, you needed two out of the three in Townsville to have any chance. It looks like zero out of three. No Barren River. 
it's it is not a lot of upsides tonight. No, um, one of the tough days in the job, but there's plenty I'm sure we can learn from this about how we go about connecting with voters, particularly from Brisbane, making sure that um, we're, we're listening and understanding and um, learning from this opportunity. And something that uh, I don't think many people foresaw is that you might go backwards. You started with 38 seats, you're at 33 at the moment, six are in doubt. That would be a sobering prospect. Look, I think um, anybody who's looked at how recent elections have gone in this COVID environment has seen oppositions go backwards and governments go forwards. Um, of course, we hoped that wouldn't happen here, particularly given um, the the efforts that had been put in by so many outstanding local candidates. When I think of um, the enormous effort put in by Lauren Day in Maywa, um, I think what a loss it is to the parliament not to have a woman of that talent representing this state. When I think about Janet Wishart in Mansfield, it's a <coughs> terrible loss to see somebody um, as bright and able and connected with some of the most, um, you know, some, some of the most interesting communities in our state, not in the parliament. That's a huge loss for, for us, but it's also a loss for Queensland. So there's plenty of um, disappointments tonight, um, but we, we have to um, respect Queenslanders' decision and um, hear what they've had to say in their verdict tonight. Senator Stoker, we're going to head to the Gold Coast. That was an LNP stronghold. Anthony Green, how's it looking now? Well, the first thing we'll look at is Gavin, which was the one Labor seat on the Gold Coast. <coughs> Megan Scanlon won it at the last election up against Kirsten Jackson from the, from the uh, LNP. Uh, Megan Scanlon's well ahead on first preferences. And when we look at the swing, there's a 6.7% swing to Labor. So Megan Scanlon's been easily returned as the member for Gavin. Uh, next door in Coomera, it's a tighter contest. We've got 50.1% of the vote counted. Labor's, the LNP's just ahead on first preferences with votes for various candidates. We have a preference count, and at the moment we're seeing a 3.3% swing and the seat's too close to call. The LNP are ahead. So Coomera will be one of those seats that is certain to be in doubt again at the end of tonight. Uh, Burley. Wayne Rabbit Bartholomew, 61% counted. He's behind by 4%. There's 8% 8, 9% 8, there with the Greens, 7% for One Nation. We've got a two-party preferred count showing a 3% swing to Labor. Um, and it, it still comes down to 518 We think the LNP will retain it on those numbers. And Bonnie, uh, Sam O'Connor won this for the first time. It was a new seat at the last election. He won it. I think he's the grand, the great nephew of Sir Lou Edwards, uh, former Liberal Party leader in, this, in Queensland. Um, he's got over 50% of the first preference vote. And when you look at the swing, he's got a 10% swing to him. So that's one of the biggest swings to the ANP in the state. Um, and it shows rather that Bonnie and Gavin, they aren't far apart. And there's a 17% difference in the swing between the two seats and they're going in opposite directions. So I think the thing is that this election, the redistribution was last time. Members have got in this time, and both Megan Scanlon and Sam O'Connor were elected for the first time at the last election. And incumbency is such a big factor, even in urban electorates in Queensland, bigger in Queensland than I'd, I'd say in the, in the southern states. Interesting, Anthony, thank you. David Janetsky. Um, Sam O'Connor's result uh, is a perfect example of a, of a young MP who's come in really hungry for the job and has done everything in his community um, to help them. I've been down with Sam a number of times and he will, he will stop at nothing to, to get to his constituents. He'll fry sausages, he'll deliver um, waters, bottles of water to sporting clubs. Oh, um, Sam probably is uh, one young guy we need to go and look at how he's campaigned to take what was a marginal seat. Uh, it was certainly hotly contested in 2017. And again, I know there are lots of resources poured into Bonnie by the Labor Party to try and get it. Uh, and Sam has just proven what an effective local member can achieve uh, doing those little things. All politics is local and, and young Sam has proven it, uh, how you can get into your seat, embed yourself in it and make you an indispensable part of the community. And plus 10% swing there. So exactly. And, and that, that shows you know, exactly what an effective local MP can achieve. So and hats off to Sam. So David Janetsky, one of the, the few bright spots for the LNP on the Gold Coast there, but in terms of looking down the barrel now of a third term in a row in opposition, I'm wondering what that means for the LNP, the Liberal National Party, as a, as a united party. Are there any implications for that? Uh, look, I think uh, we're well past those conversations now, Jess. 
you know, we're in this uh, and we've just got to get better. And when it comes time, we've proven the, the federal, in a federal sphere, how effective the Liberal National Party can be here in Queensland. Uh, what we now need to do is we're going to have to go back to the drawing board, look again uh, and come back better. And, except, uh, except federally, the Liberals and the Nationals sit in separate party rooms. That, yeah, that well, is a difference. Th yeah, fundamentally though, here in Queensland, no one will ever know that. Um, you know, to the local people in local electorates fighting for local issues, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's only when they cross the border and go to Canberra uh, do they sit in separate party rooms. So fundamentally here in Queensland, uh, when it comes to campaigning, our federal MPs are, are campaigning under a Liberal National Party banner and uh, we just simply need to go back to the drawing board and, and come back better, that's all. And David, do you know if uh, Deb Frecklington has telephoned the Premier, Anastasia Palaszczuk, yet? No, I'm not sure about that. Okay, you know. well, we'll be standing by uh, to see if Deb Frecklington does concede defeat. Uh, Anthony Chisholm and Stephen Miles, let's get back to Labor here because this is your night. Another four years, this is the first four year term, so you, you've got the Treasury benches for four years and Labor is somewhat of a, an era now because you'll have been in power for 29 of 35 years by the time the next term's up. Uh, yeah, the, the four year term uh, is, is a big deal and it'll, it'll give us a real chance to uh, focus on what we've said we'd focus on, um, you know, the uh, health and economic recovery post the pandemic and uh, four years is the right horizon to be able to plan for something like that. So I think the four year term will really come into its own uh, in, in, this, in this era, in this time. And Anthony Chisholm, Anthony Green was saying incumbency is even more pronounced as a power in Queensland. Do you yeah. agree? Uh, I think because we do have a lot of regional seats, obviously it's easier for them to build a profile. There's, um, despite what uh, Ms. Bat, Mr. Ashby said earlier, there's a bit of uh, local media that you can get hold of. Uh, so I think that does present opportunities. Uh, I do want to pay tribute to Anastasia Palaszczuk, though, for what she has achieved tonight. Mm -hmm. And when you think about someone coming in after 2012 with six colleagues, um, to winning that election in 2015, winning a majority in 2017, and then winning again tonight, uh, where if sh uh, she serves a full term, will overtake Wayne Goss and Peter Beattie, uh, who are Labor heroes. Um, Anastasia Palaszczuk is now on that same pedestal. Uh, we in the Labor Party only have a modern history in Queensland because uh, Sir Joe kept us out of power for so long. Uh, but from 89 uh, to now, um, that is a phenomenal achievement from Anastasia. Uh, and it is just testament to her uh, and her ability to connect with Queenslanders, stay humble and in touch. And I think that's what served her well this year, particularly during the pandemic with Steve. And by the end of this four-year term, towards that period, she will in fact have passed Peter Beattie's time as Premier. Yeah, it is just absolutely remarkable. And I did joke on uh, during the week that maybe that was part of Peter's motivation uh, when he sort of spoke out on the border issue. But I'm, I'm sure Peter wouldn't be as childish as that. We all know him so well. Uh, but in, in all seriousness, like I just, you know, cannot speak highly enough about what Anastasia has achieved to bring the Labor Party back from the dead basically, um, to now be uh, well, any Labor Premier, Premier here Premier. arriving at her function, Anthony Chisholm. Yeah. Now, please and continue. Look, and just you can just see how calm and cautious she is. I remember when I first spoke to her in 2015 when it looked like we were going to win that first time, and she's still the same person today. Just the, what you see is what you get, no matter if you're talking to the CEO of BHP or the punters at the Cowboys Leagues Club where Steve and I were with her on Sunday. Uh, always so warm. Well, she's entering, entering now. Was going to sign in, but then told you're all right, you're the Premier. <laughs> We'd sign her in. Yeah. This is the blue flip. Bluefin Fishing Club in Anala that she's entering. Obviously, these are all her supporters. Anastasia Palaszczuk, 51 years of age, entered Parliament in 2006 in the seat of Anala on Brisbane's western outskirts, taking over where her father, Henry Palaszczuk, left off. Now winning three terms in office, she's the first female party leader to win three elections. These are her nieces, I think, Stephen Miles, is that right? Yeah. And, uh, lovely, yeah. Surrounded by family there tonight, no dad, dad Henry, no doubt dad Henry is there and in Laurel, the audience Mother too. Laurel will be there as well, I'm sure. As Anthony Chisholm mentioned, Anastasia Palaszczuk became, yeah. yep. That's Anastasia Palaszczuk's mother there, obviously incredibly proud. 
and then there's her father. The seat's only been held by a Palaszczuk since it was created in 1992. This victory tonight is all about the Premier. Labor ran a presidential campaign. I think her face was probably on every call flute around the state. Correct me if I'm wrong, on every how to vote card. Most on the how to vote cards, like $300 notes, like our opponents. And in this last term, she has dealt with bushfires, floods, but it's her record with regards to the handling of coronavirus that she ran on. And Jess, we're told that Deb Frecklington has not yet conceded. She hasn't delivered that concession to Anastasia Palaszczuk. So until that happens, I would imagine that it's, it would be unusual if she was going to claim victories. But we'll hear from the Premier very shortly, it would appear. Just that be summoned to the stage. John Battles. Well, good evening, Queensland, and good evening, Anala. It's wonderful to be here at the Anala Bluefin Fishing Club. acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Can I acknowledge the wonderful President of our party, John Badams. <laughs> our wonderful campaign director, Julianne Campbell. <laughs> the mighty army of our Labor Party workers right throughout Queensland. <laughs> to all of those community workers and friends that have joined us on this effort, and the mighty union movement who stands up for workers' rights every single day in this state. Can I also especially acknowledge uh, the Deputy Premier Stephen Miles for his outstanding job uh, with the health response and working with me every day. So I really want to acknowledge Stephen. And my other good friend, the Treasurer Cameron Dick as well. And his brother, Milton Dick, the federal member. <laughs> but most importantly, can I acknowledge the people of Queensland. It has not been an easy year for many, many people. For many Queenslanders, I know it's been an incredibly tough year. It's been tough not being able to see your family and friends in other states or even around the world as we've been in the midst of a global pandemic. But here in Queensland, we've all stood strong and united. And together, we're on top of the pandemic. And if we continue to work together, we will stay strong. Yeah. I grew up a few streets away from here. And as a young child, education was important and family was important. There's nothing more important than family. There's nothing more important than the dignity of work and people being able to get up every morning to be able to provide for their family. And this year has been tough because of COVID. Many, many people have lost their jobs through no fault of their own. And I know that during this election, there are many people out there in Queensland who have voted Labor for the very first time. I thank you from the bottom of my heart and I will return that respect every single day. Yeah. <laughs> Queensland
Queensland is the best place on earth, and it is the best state in Australia. And Queenslanders are tough. And I get my inspiration every single day by the people that I meet. Whether it's up in the Torres Strait, whether it's out at Longreach, whether it's in my local shopping centre here at Richlands, whether it's in Rocky, whether it's in an apprentice shop, whether it's in any business right throughout this state. And the guiding principle is we all want the best for each other. We all want the best. And we go through tough times and we work together and we listen and we get through it. But I also know that we need to have a strong recovery plan. This has been a tough year and we've got to get people back into work. And I give my commitment to the people of this state that my team, we will roll up our sleeves and we will get back to work as quickly as possible for you. And I'm confident we will do it with a majority Labor government. And we will ensure that our growing state has the nurses and the doctors that are needed for their hospitals. We will make sure that we have those police officers that are needed right across the state because we value the work that our frontline officers do, the paramedics, the firefighters. These are the people that, when times are tough, stand with you, that get through you, get through things with you. They're by our side and we will back them. And our state is an incredible state. It's diverse, it's got so much talent and it's got so much depth. And our regional plans are going to be tailored for each region to ensure that we are matching the needs of that community with the skills and training of the young people to give hope and opportunity for every young person to achieve their dreams in this state. And we will do that together. So to my cabinet, can I thank them for their hard work? Get back to work as soon as possible. <laughs> to all of the, to all of my uh, caucus colleagues, and also to to all of our members that actually ran for the Labor Party as well. Thank you. And I also want to uh, commend the leader of the opposition for what I think has been a very good campaign. It's the first time that two women have gone head to head. And I think people might comment that it was a much more respectful debate than uh, we have seen in times gone past. Now, I would get in trouble if I didn't mention uh, Bruce Saunders in Maryborough, because we are going to be making trains in Queensland, friends. Manufacturing is at the heart of everything that we do. And we are going to make sure we make more here in Queensland. We don't need to import as much. We've got the talent here. And finally, let me say this. It's been tough. There's been people that have, um, for example, in aged care, that have not been able to go out to go and do their normal things and see their family. We've had people in hospitals who've been sick and haven't been able to, to see their friends and family as well. COVID has taken an incredible toll. But Queenslanders stood strong. We kept Queenslanders safe. And I want to thank Queenslanders for the work that you have done. Yeah. I am humbled and, grat and I'm deeply humbled that I am the Premier of this great state and you have placed your faith in me for the next four years. <laughs> there has never been a time like this in our lifetime. And I hope that we get through it 
stronger and better. And we don't look back in about the, about the crisis that was, but how we came out of it stronger and better in the future. I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, the, our national president, Wayne Swan, who's with us here this evening as well. Thank you, Wayne. And I'd like to acknowledge my family, because family is everything. I know every single Queenslander out there, out there agrees with me. There is nothing more important than family. And when times get tough, as they have in the past, it's your family that's there to support you in the good times and the bad. And we stood strong, Queensland. We stood together. We stared down our critics. And we've come out of it all the better for it. So I thank Queensland. It's an amazing privilege. And I promise you that I will roll up my sleeves tomorrow, get back to work and continue to build a better Queensland. Thank you. victory before the loser has been able to concede defeat. Yeah, obviously uh, with the COVID pandemic we are in uh, uncertain times so I'm sure I'll uh, put it down to that. What did you make of her speech? Uh, I thought it was just typical Anastasia, uh, warm, uh, very uh, help, heartfelt but also humble. I think she's spoken very nicely of the opposition leader, Deb Franklington, um, uh, which was uh, really nice. Uh, and I think she then outlined what she wants to do. Obviously, that four-year term is important. This is the first four-year term that we've ever had in Queensland. Um, and uh, let's face it, we are in tough economic conditions. Uh, the health epidemic has had a big impact uh, and the government are going to have to be bold. They're going to have to roll out those uh, promises. So they've got a lot to do. And I think the Premier was really clear that that is what her focus will be on, which is, I think, what Queenslanders would want to hear as well. So, um, Steve, uh, one beer tonight, back to work tomorrow. That's what, it, that's what it sounds like. All right, well, we're going to bring you Deb Frecklington's concession speech now. I'd like to congratulate Anastasia Palaszczuk on her victory tonight. Now, I may not agree with the Premier a lot of the time, but I respect her as an opponent and as the leader of our state. But most of all, I respect the voters of Queensland. And we are so privileged to live in this democracy. Now, Queenslanders have made their decision, and I thank each and every one of them for voting and for upholding our democracy. This decision is respected by the Liberal National Party. And I am so proud of the campaign that we have fought. And I am so proud of the 93 candidates that ran the good race. Now, our candidates fought hard, but they fought fair. We laid out a positive plan for Queensland, a plan to lead the state out of recession and a plan to secure Queensland's next generation. But ladies and gentlemen, Queensland still needs a plan. We're in the middle of an economic crisis and it is far from over. So for Queensland's sake, I urge the Premier, I urge the Premier to take action 
to grow our economy and to create jobs in this state. I urge the Premier to support our most important industries and I urge the Premier to support the regions. Yeah. Thank you, Ross. Now, I promise that the Liberal National Party will continue to play its part in our democracy. And I will continue to play my part in the Liberal National Party, and I will continue as the leader of this great party. going to continue to hold the Palaszczuk government to account. We will speak up for those who have been forgotten and left behind. We're going to fight for the families of this great state because families mean more than anything and just like my family. So to mum and dad, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. To my brother Ross and soon to be sister in law Joe, thank you for coming down and bringing mum and dad here. But also to my sister Jackie and my brother in law John and my brother Tim and my sister in law Tammy who have fought the good fight in Nanango as well. So I really do want to give a big shout out to the people of Nanango. I just have to say this, the Liberal National Party has once again won the seat of Nanango. <laughs> Which is very exciting. And I thank my entire campaign team out there as well. I really want to play, pay tribute to my incredible husband, Jason, and those three amazing girls, Isabella, Lucy and Elke. As you know, I can't always be there, be there with you, but you're always with me, and I really, really love you all. We love you. Thank you, Luz. <laughs> thank you, Luz. Now, I want to thank the people who have stood beso beside me and fought this campaign, all of the members of parliament, all of the candidates, my incredible deputy, Tim Mander, thank you so very much. Tim's done an, a great job tonight on ABC too. Thank you for taking it up to Miles. Uh, that was, I, I've, I've enjoyed watching that. Uh, uh, but there's so many people to thank through this campaign and so many of you are here in the room tonight. Thousands of you who have stood out on the polling booths, who have done pre-poll, who have knocked on doors, who have made the phone calls, who have helped us with policy who have done everything possible within every breath that you have because you are the Liberal National Party and I am so proud of you. And I very much appreciate to each and every party member from Cynthia Hardy down, our president, every single person within and involved within the Liberal National Party, thank you so very much for holding the morals and the values that we hold so dear on behalf of the people of Queensland. Thank you very much. Follow and his campaign team. You guys are superstars. Thank you so much, Link. And to Matt Jeffries, you have just been incredible. To you and the opposition staff, three years of, of a Three years of, of being in opposition is tough. Five years is, is extremely tough, and we're going to fight every minute of the next four years. 
to get there. So to Matt and your team, thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm sorry we didn't get there, but I'm just so grateful to each and every one of you. I've been almost everywhere in Queensland over the last four weeks, and I know how hard all of you have worked and how hard our volunteers have worked and how hard our candidates and our MPs have worked. Now, no other party has worked harder than the Liberal National Party. You've given it everything, but this was not our time. But our time will come, and we will get Queensland working again. Thank you. And Brett Frecklington there conceding defeat to Anastasia Palaszczuk in the Queensland state election of 2020. A couple of unusual things just happening tonight. Anastasia Palaszczuk declaring victory before Deb Frecklington conceding defeat, and Deb Frecklington declaring she'll stay on as leader, or even though she's lost the election, Jess, which is also something that's quite unusual. All right, for his final summary of the evening, let's go to Anthony Green. Yes, we're seeing, let's look at the primary votes for the last time, we're now up to 54% counted, so this is a much higher number. And the Labor votes continue to sort of drift up through the night as those votes have come in. So. Um, the pre-polls have certainly not been disadvantaged to Labor. If you look at the change in vote, again, 4.2% up for Labor. So that has increased. That's increased since the last election, and it has increased through the night. And One Nation have continued to be the big loser of the election. Their vote down 6.1%. If we look at the seats that we've still got in doubt or changing, we've only given three seats of change party. That We believe that Labor has won both Caloundra and Palmerstone from the LNP. Good results for the uh, for the Labor Party on the Sunshine Coast, and the Greens have gained South Brisbane. The seats we've got in doubt. Let me now hit this button, and then I do this. Um, we've got the LNP ahead in Coomera and Glasshouse, two seats they hold, so we haven't given them away. We've got the Labor ahead in Cooper and McConnell, where the Greens have slipped to third spot, and the gap has widened. It looks like Labor's more likely to win them now. And Labor's ahead in Harvey Bay and Nicklin. Now I actually want to do those two seats because it's been quite quite intriguing. We've got a 61 percent count in Nickland. Marty Hunt won it for the first time at the last election. And if you look at the two-party preferred, we've got a good two-party preferred sample. There's been a 5.7% swing and Labor is ahead in Nickland. Now, that, that's why um, our projection is looking towards 51 seats or, some, or, uh, or the like. I'm not sure that will carry through and Labor will win Nickland, but it shows that that Sunshine Coast in particular have had a very, a, a big tourist area as well as a residential area, has had a very different reaction at this election to other tourist areas. Is there something about the way COVID has worked in Queensland which has caused that in Nickland? And the other city is Harvey Bay, not quite as touristy a centre, it's much more of a retirement area. An incredibly slow count, only 17%. One of the other networks has called it, and you can't call Harvey Bay on 17% of the vote. Um, the two party preferred, there's a big swing, um, and Labor is ahead, but that's 17% counted. There are uh, I think it's something like 17,000 pre-polls and 4,000 absents which aren't in there yet. Um, and they're obviously still being counted. They may be finished tonight. So you can't call Harvey Bay even though, but to have at the end of the night Labor ahead in Harvey Bay in Nicklin just shows we've given Labor a definite 47 seats and it's not going to turn around for there. Now, I need to draw, draw the chamber one last time and I can fill it in with a prediction. Uh, there's the chamber. Let's, let's look at the seats we're definitely giving away and Labor's on 47. So Labor is in majority with the seats we're definitely giving away. If we draw our prediction, which we haven't done all night, Labor goes up to 51 and the LNP's on 35. Now, that may, may drift down to 47, 48, maybe 49, 50, but it's not going to turn around. I don't think the Labor Party has lost its majority. It's got a definite 47 seats and there's four seats it's still competitive in. So that, that's the wrap of the evening. It's been quite a, quite a slow count, a difficult count, um, that uh, once those bigger batches started to come in, it became clearer. Once we got those preferences for the second half of the Albert alphabet, it became clearer. Um, there'll be a lot to pick over amongst these results. Anthony, thank you so much.
We'll ask for final thoughts from everyone on the panel before we close tonight. David Janetsky, can I ask you to reflect on the speech that we just saw from Deb Frecklington? Were you surprised to see her say she's going to continue as leader? Well, firstly, Jess, I, I do want to offer my congratulations to the Premier and, and to the Deputy Premier, um, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, she, the Premier is held in deep respect by the Queensland people and, and um, that's been proven again tonight. Um, look, Deb uh, obviously is my friend and, and she has given absolutely everything in this campaign and she's performed extraordinarily well and I actually would like to think that as an opposition this was the boldest campaign uh, we've seen in Queensland for a very long time. You know, whether it be talking about the new Bradfield or second M1 or, or a whole range of other infrastructure projects. You know, and let alone reforms that we've talked about, the child safety or domestic violence laws, uh, across a whole range of areas, um, we had put forward a positive plan. Um, you know, Deb, uh, Deb's full of energy, and, and yeah, she's ready to go again. And, and we just need to pick up, uh, pick up our bundle, uh, start again. And, and um, we've got a budget uh, as promised by um, the premier and the deputy premier, so they better get cracking because it's coming very soon. <laughs> And Amanda Stoker, she was very gracious in defeat. She was, and um, just as the Premier showed a lovely human warmth in her speech, so too is um, Deb someone who shows um, those lovely human qualities that um, I think when people get to know her, um, they, they come to really appreciate. It's, it's going to be really important for us as a party to look for ways that we can um, understand and connect with people in the southeast corner without losing the trust of people in the regions. That's really important for us. And it's also really important that we keep the pressure on Labor throughout this upcoming term to make sure that regional development isn't forgotten, that policies like um, native edge and energy prices and um, the like don't continue to crush the prospects of people who live in our regions so that they can have the same life prospects as people um, here in the southeast. And that's about making sure all Queenslanders have the chance to reach their potential. I'm really pleased that um, there are members of the team who are still committed to those principles into the future. Stephen Miles, Deputy Premier, final thoughts. Oh, thanks so much, Matt. Before I'll... you get back to Cabinet work, like the Premier <laughs> get said. Get working on that, on that budget. Mm. Um, uh, when will we see that, by the way? Uh, we said December. So okay. budget and estimates in December, uh, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, I wanted to uh, acknowledge particularly uh, Tim, but also Amanda and Deb in her speech, and David for joining the panel now. Uh, we, 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 uh, we might have our arguments in front of the cameras, but behind the scenes we get to know each other as people, and these are, these are difficult moments, and we've, we've been there too. Um, uh, but this is a significant... A historic victory for Anastasia Palaszczuk, one that will go down uh, in the record books. I think it's very well deserved. As David said, uh, Anastasia is well respected by Queensland. Queenslanders know her, and I think that's what's been borne out in these in these results. It's a, it's a, a great victory for her. Uh, and I just wanted, on a final final note, this, this this election was a lot of firsts, but it was also the it was not only the first one where there were two women leaders up against each other, but it was the first one uh, run by a female state. Secretary. Secretary and Julianne Campbell, and she's done a great job leading our campaign. Anthony Chisholm? Yeah, and just to echo um, Steve's sentiments there, she has done a great job, and uh, the result is a testament to that. Uh, Labor was going for a third term. Uh, the LNP from opposition have not picked up one seat. Uh, so it is obviously a disaster for the LNP. Uh, I think David and Amanda have said that they need to learn the lessons from that. Uh, but I think it is a night for Anastasia and the Labor team. Uh, remarkable achievement winning that third term, particularly when you look at where they've come from. Uh, and it is up to them now to deliver for Queensland because there will be high expectations and they need to meet those. Thank you, Anthony Chisholm. Well, certainly the accidental Premier of 2015 has become the Labor legend of 2020. And Anthony Green, I just want to bring you in for one final time. 
Yeah, I'll just, I just want a, a few thank yous. There's a huge logistical exercise to get computers to work. And in this election, we've been running two computers because we're replacing the old one. And there's a guy called Saikat Kisha, who I've really ridden hard for the last week to try and get the data from the Electoral Commission. And I owe him a big apology because I've been a bit rough a couple of times to get these, to get these projects working stuff. I've really got to thank um, Casey Briggs over here, who's been uh, my seat producer. He thinks I'm an absolute wimp for not calling the election earlier, but, you know, it's me on camera, Casey. <laughs> and <laughs> Oscar Colburn, who's helped me. And and there's a team uh, under Matt Carlov who was dealing with the new system who are thinking, feeling a bit depressed because the new system had a few bugs in it. But look, it's a huge effort. People don't quite understand how complex these elections are. Uh, the Electoral Commission's done a complete rewrite. They've been trying to run an election during a time of COVID. And I think there's a lot of people showing a lot of patience for a lot of problems that have got, gone around with this election. So while we're all concentrating on the politics, I mean, and I think it's something important to compare with what's going on in America at the moment. There's a lot of goodwill and acceptance and people ensuring that everybody gets to vote and these things happen. We're going to have all sorts of debates on Wednesday this week when we watch the American election results about whether someone will concede, whether people will accept the results. And I think we should be proud as Australians and as Queenslanders that we accept the results, that we run these elections well. And um, today is just another exercise in democracy and uh, everyone will get up tomorrow and the same, the world will be the same. So. So uh, I think it's been a good night and as I said, thanks for everybody and thanks for all your help up there and hopefully next time I'll be in Queensland. Yes, we'll look forward to that, Anthony Green, and we'll also look forward to your expertise for US votes as well, as you say, on Wednesday. And that brings tonight's coverage of Queensland Votes 2020 to an end. The Palaszczuk government has won tonight with an almost certain majority, but there are still some numbers to be counted. Nevertheless, just like in the Northern Territory, the ACT and New Zealand, Anastasia Palaszczuk and her government have been rewarded by voters for their handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight's result will be studied carefully by political leaders across the country. Queenslanders have given the Palaszczuk Labor government a third term in office through until 2024. And you can stay up to date at abc.net.au slash Queensland Votes on radio and on TV. And of course, thank you to our panellists tonight, Senator Anthony Chisholm, Deputy Premier Stephen Miles, Shadow Attorney General David Janetsky, and Senator Amanda Stoker, and of course earlier, Tim Mander. And thank you to our Chief Election Analyst, Anthony Green. Don't forget Insiders is on tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock on ABC TV. But for now, good night. Good night.